can start. Share your screen, yeah. maybe. Share. Uh... Great. Okay, then I, I will start my second lecture. This is about uh, um, entropic proofs of irreversibility theorems. Well, <clears throat> what is uh, this irreversibility theorems about? The, um, if we have this idea of the normalization group. Um, that the idea is that uh, if you describe in the Lagrangian way uh, theory uh, in terms of some coupling constants, as you change the scale as, uh, where, where you look at the theory, um, you, can, uh, you can mimic the change of the physics uh, by changing the coupling constants. <clears throat> so there is a flow in the space of coupling constants <clears throat> with the scale and uh, in particular, you expect that the, for very small scales, you have the uh, ultraviolet fixed point that is described by a CFT, and you have an infrared fixed point for large distances described by another CFT. <clears throat> um, and then if you, if you only have the two CFTs, you can, you can wonder where you can connect them by a quantum field theory with scales in the middle. Um, and the irreversibility theorems basically tell you that uh, if, if you can connect uh, some CFT1 to CFT2, one in the ultraviolet and the other in the infrared, you cannot do the reverse. You cannot connect CFT2 to CFT1. Um, <clears throat> so um, in this way of expressing things, uh, is somehow um, uh, adapted to the perturbative uh, scheme because uh, you have to talk about coupling constants. And if you want to really prove this irreversibility, you need uh, to test uh, the normalization group non perturbatively. Um, you also need uh, a quantity that, uh, that decreases or along the normalization group, which is uh, defined for all quantum field theories. Uh, the, the first theorem well, that is proved was, or theorem was proved was the Samolosic of one in, in dimension two uh, and uses correlator of a stress tensor that are defined for any theory and uh, are well-defined quantities, non-perturbatively. And uh, for four dimensions, uh, Komarkovsky and Schumer used the Dilaton effective action. Here we will use the entanglement entropy that is also defined for any theory and it has some, <clears throat> uh, some non-perturbative inequalities. So in order to prove something like this, some irreversibility theorem, you need uh, two things. First, you need a, a quantity that is the, the one that is going to uh, go down along the normalization group, let's say in, between the fixed points, that is finite and well-defined for any CFT. So you need to put a number for these CFTs uh, which is order uh, along the normalization group. Uh, and and it is it's well defined for a CFT and it has to be dimensionless. The CFT doesn't have uh, dimension couplings. And, and here in the, in the uh, we, will, we will come to the fact that these, these quantities are this renormalization group charges, let's call it. One is for even dimension is A, is um, the anomaly coefficient the, the, in the earlier term of the, in the trace anomaly. And uh, for all, all dimensions over the space time dimensions is F is the, the constant term in the free energy of a, of a D dimensional Euclidean sphere. In the entanglement entropy, I, I haven't had the time to, to show it in the, last, uh, in the last lecture, but these two quantities are the universal pieces of entanglement entropies of, a, of a spheres. So they appear naturally in entanglement entropy of a sphere. And another thing that we need is an inequality that is valid for all quantum field theories and is valid, you have to have an inequality that is valid also for the interpolating theory between the two fixed points.
So, uh, so entanglement entropy exists for any theory, and uh, uh, as we have already uh, shown, that this this entanglement entropy is a function of these diamond-shaped sets, uh, or you can say it's a function of these pieces of Cauchy surfaces, spatial surfaces. But they do not; it, it doesn't depend on which Cauchy surface you use for the same diamond because of causality. And it also has an interest in powerful inequality that is called strong subadditivity. Strong subadditivity is the, the most uh, profound or the most uh, <clears throat> uh, complete uh, or difficult uh, um, inequality that the entropy has. Uh, it has some information, of course, about the unitarity of the Hilbert space, but it's expressed very different in a very different way than the usual unitarity applied to correlation functions. In this context of quantum field theory, the inequality takes this uh, simple geometrical form that uh, you, you take two regions, they have to, the boundaries have to cut each other, so they have to lie in the same Cauchy surface, let's say, in the same spatial surface. And then the entropy of A plus the entropy of B is greater or equal than the entropy of the intersection plus the entropy of the union. This is the inequality I will use. Uh, as, as it's expressed like this, it's, it's very difficult to understand what is the meaning of this. But uh, if, you, if you express it in terms of relative entropies that I haven't discussed, it's more clear the meaning. For example, it tells you that the mutual information is growing with uh, between two, two regions or two, two algebras, let's say, is growing with the size of the algebras. Uh, it means that uh, the amount of correlations always always grows with the with the as you as you put more and more operators. So, but then, <clears throat> then what we what we what we need? We, we are going to to test the randomization group flow with a, with a strong subadditivity. But one point that is important is if we if we want to if we aim to the the irreversibility theorem, it must be the case that the inequality that we have to use has to saturate for a conformal field theory, because in a conformal field theory, uh, there is no renormalization group running going on. So it has to saturate there. So it means that we have to find a way to, to find some regions such that the inequality is equal to zero uh, for a conformal field theory. And this, this inequality, when it saturates, the state is called a Markov state. It's a kind of generalization of a classical Markov chain. Um, <clears throat> and it can be seen that, uh, as, as I said, a saturation of an inequality, it means that it's very powerful. It's always very powerful uh, when, you, when you say that the, the, saturate, the inequality saturates. And in, in this case, it means that if you express your state in the in these regions, uh, you you um, divide the region by as one, two, and three. Two is intersection, and one is the exclusive part of A, and three is the exclusive part of B. Then the the reduced states, the reduced states have some peculiar form, and uh, you can see that uh, in, in a Markov state. The, the Hilbert space in two can be divided as a sum, as a sum of products of different Hilbert spaces in such a way that the density matrix in one, two, and three is just a probabilistic sum of products of one and some piece of two and the other piece of two and three. So it's like it has this form. Uh, of course, this is not general. This is only for Markov states. And, and then if you trace over two, if you trace over two, what you get is the density matrix in one and three. And if you see from, from this uh, expression, this density matrix is a so probabilistic sum of pro tensor products of density matrices. And this is what is called a separable state. So it's a state with us in, it, that doesn't have any entanglement. So for having a Markov state, you need no entanglement between one and three. And then we have a, 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 what seems to be a problem because 
uh, in general, there is always entanglement in quantum field theory for any two regions due to something that is called the Re-Slider theorem. <clears throat> Can you recall the theorem? I don't know if everybody is familiar. Yeah, yeah, I, I will, I will, I will. Uh, now I, I will. What is a real slider theorem? The real slider theorem tells you that you have a region, you have a region, and then with the field operators inside the region, you have an algebra, and acting with this algebra on the vacuum, you can generate a dense set of states in the in the Hilbert space. It means that acting on the vacuum. Um, doing linear combinations of, uh, of this, this product of operators, but on the vacuum, you can generate even very far away particles. This is quite, uh, quite uh, strange or amazing at, at the first uh, look at it. But, um, but of course, you can generate them with a small probability, but, uh, but still you can generate them. And the proof is quite simple. It uses analyticity of correlators uh, in a ball, if you have a correlators, <clears throat> for example, um, you can say, well, suppose that this, these states do not generate a dense set of in the Hilbert space, then it must be the case that there is a, another state, this state phi here, that is orthogonal to all this, where x1, xn belong to this, to this region. So it means that this correlator is zero for x, all the x is inside this, this region. But then analyticity tells you that you can extend these this correlation functions where x, uh, x1, xn now are everywhere in, this, in the, in the space-time, and it will always be 0, uh, 2. But once you have that, you already know that multi multiplying the vacuum by the fields in any point of the space-time, you get a dense set. So, this will be a dense set now, and then means that this phi has to be zero. So there are, it means that uh, if, you, if you have this equality only in this region, you have this equality everywhere, and it must be the case that this is, is zero. <laughs> so, um, well, but what, what does the real slider theorem tells then uh, in this particular case? It tells that if you have, a, uh, for example, this situation, one, two, and three. We are doing strong subjectivity here. Uh, if you take operators in the region one, you can uh, multiply uh, to the vacuum. You can generate any, let's say, any state in the Hilbert space. In particular, you could generate some something like a, an EPR pair, something some uh, pair of qubits that are entangled between one and three. It means that the original state, the vacuum. Uh, could not have uh, zero entanglement between one and three, because entanglement is always decreased under local operations. So it has to be the case that uh, that the original state, the vacuum, was already entanglement entangled between one and three. So it means that you are never getting the Markov state. You are never getting the Markov state here. Uh, so, any question? Uh, I don't see from the chat. Okay. Anything. Okay. So, well, it means that uh, if you do a strong subjectivity of this of these uh, regions, you will get a non-zero number, uh, and then we cannot use this 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 position of regions to uh, to get a, a saturation at the conformal fixed point. But there is a way out of this. Horacio, why you yeah. needed the saturation of, uh, to, to Sorry, uh, the first place? What was the... No, idea? well, the idea is that um, I'm trying to use a strong subadditivity to test the romanization group flow. Yeah. Right? And if, uh, if uh, I, I test it, for example, for uh, CFT, it should be that nothing happens. Uh -huh. If I'm interested in testing the normalization group flow, it should be the case that nothing happens. So I have to use a, a, a geometrical uh, setup for my region such a way that it saturates, it saturates for a conformal field theory. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. then I cannot use 
this is position of lesion, for example. There is a question. But, what yeah. do you mean by distillable entanglement? Oh, yeah. Well, distillable entanglement means that uh, um, uh, if you have entanglement between one and three, distillable means that doing uh, operations, classical, uh, sorry, uh, local operation here, hmm. uh, you, can, you can produce some number of EPR pairs. You can change the state to, so you can distill in, a, in EPR pairs, let's say. It's a, it's a way of counting the, how much entanglement you, you have. Another question. Yeah. Markov property is then the property of the state and the space-time regions we choose. Yeah, Markov property is a is a is this quality here, uh, and it's a property of the state in in the two regions that we choose exactly. In this case, I'm, I'm looking uh, at Markov property for the vacuum. I will always be in the vacuum. Um, uh, for for some reasons. So then, but there is a way out of this because uh, the real slide theorem already tell you told, tell you that you need some volume because you need an, this use analyticity property. So you need some volume to do this, and then the the way out is to think the case where region one and region three doesn't have any volume. How how would it like that? How would it be? It would be something like this. Region A is this rectangle here, a space-time rectangle, let's say, and region B is this one. Mm. Region two is the intersection, and then region one is just this this new line, and region three is just this new line. So, two uh, joined with one gives you all this causal region, generates all this causal region. Say so. Um, in this case, region one and region three do not have any volume, and the, in this way, the real slider theorem is bypassed. Um, but still, you you can see that in many cases uh, that uh, even in so region one and region three, for example, here also, this piece of the surface and this piece of of the surface that is in A but not in intersection, is a null surface. These are, null, are, are surfaces with boundary on the null cone. But in this case, the same region, this region one and region two are null. But in not, it's not true that uh, you have saturation of strong subjectivity for all, um, for all uh, regions with boundary in the same null surface. <clears throat> it doesn't happen that, uh, that this is true in, in, in every case. But still there is a, there is a quite simple case where this does happen. That is a case of you have a null plane. If you have a null plane, uh, and then you can take regions whose boundary, spatial boundary, are, uh, is a curve on this null plane, this curve gamma here. So the region is, has a space-time volume, is all uh, the, let's say, the future horizon is all uh, of the future part of the null plane uh, after gamma. And then you have to do the, the past horizon is more complicated, but the region have a space time volume are very large. A generalization, let's say of Rindler wedge of the, if I take a, just a line, it would be Rindler wedge. And this case, what, happen, what happens? What happens is that, uh, uh, now, if you if you have a a, a, um, a Lorentz invariant cutoff, Lorentz invariant cutoff for the theory, then your entropy will be invariant and then boost. And a boost axiometrically on this null plane, just um, dilatating, scaling the null coordinate x plus, just uh, multiplied by some number. So if you have this property that the, the entropy, because of the vacuum is invariant under, under Lorentz and the boost, then the entropy will be the same for a curve gamma and another curve that is uh, scaling. And then you can, you can take the limit of lambda going to zero and they, the, all these curves 
are going to go to the ring wedge here. So it means that uh, if you started with some entropy, you, 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 you see that the, all these entropies are equal to the ring wedge. You can take, if you, if you are worried about the, uh, what happens in the infinity, you can take these regions just going down to the ring wedge here. So they differ only in, in a finite piece along the coordinate y. But then as all these entropies are equal, it means that if you do something like this and take the strong subadditivity here, it, it will give you zero because all the entropies are equal. For doing that, we needed a Lorentz invariant cutoff. But once you have this equality, you can lift the Lorentz invariant cutoff and use another cutoff because this equality is uh, independent of the cutoff because it, the local pieces that are produced by the cutoff uh, will cancel out in this uh, in the strong subjectivity inequality because, uh, for example, something local here appears in A, but it also appears in A union B, or something local here appears in B, and it also appears in intersection. Mm -hmm. So this statement then holds, uh, and we only needed. Lorentz invariant, Lorentz invariance, so it, it, it holds for any quantum field theory. It doesn't matter if it is conformal or not. Um, and it holds more generally for any kind of thing that you can put in the null plane. It's just a very, very geometric property. If, for example, it holds for ready entropies or for free energies of insertion of, of operators or for non local operators. Uh, say Wilson loops in two plus one dimensions, et cetera. And it also works for, for other situations, for example, uh, killing horizons in space times uh, that, that are not Minkowski, uh, where you have this type of symmetry for invariant states under the killing symmetry. You say eternal black holes, the city of space, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. So there is a question, maybe. Yeah. How does strong subadditivity inequality become equality? How how it becomes equality? Yeah. Because uh, in this case, all these entropies are the same. So the entropy of the intersection, the union, uh, and A and B, all these entropies are the same, and so it cancels. They cancel yeah. out. Um, so as as um, so then well, there is another question. They say yeah. so the vacuum state is not cyclic in this case. No, the, see, the vacuum state is cyclic and separate. Is yeah, the, the vacuum state is cyclic, but you cannot uh, do that. You cannot. Okay, it's not cyclic under. Cyclic means exactly this. Uh, sorry for people that. Uh, let me see. Cyclic means that uh, acting on, with operators inside the region on the vacuum, you get a dense set of states. Mm -hmm. cyclic. And here it's not cyclic if I take only operators in this piece of uh, in this piece of the null plane, mm -hmm. or in this piece of the null plane. So in the in the in the part that is exclusive or A or exclusive from from B. Uh, this is this is true. This is not cyclic, but there is a caveat, caveat there that. Uh, for a free theory, we can see that this is this is the case. This is not cyclic, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's, it's somehow against the the idea, the moral of the real Rider theorem. But it's not, of course, contradicting the real Rider theorem that needs a volume of, of a space time. Here is just a selfie. But there is also some other caveat that for interacting theories in the ultraviolet, there is no algebra there. There is no algebra there. Uh, because no, no operator really bounded operator can be localized in a, in a, in an old circuit. But it doesn't matter that this, this doesn't mean that the uh, inequality doesn't have any sense because we didn't use, uh, this, uh, this algebra here. We, we use a, a bigger algebra that has volume. 
right? We are not using the algebra of one or the algebra of three. We are using the algebra of A, B, intersection, and union. There will be a big diamond here. All of them have uh, operators. So, but then we have uh, this, uh, this um, uh, saturation, but uh, the, the problem is that um, <clears throat> Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of trivial saturation because all the entropies are the same for any quantum field theory. But for a conformal field theory, we can use conformal transformations. Sorry, uh, uh, Horacio, there is a, a kind of long question here. Do you want me to read it? Uh, yes. We said from Jorge Martinez, maybe you can pose it, I mean, just speak it. Yeah. Huh? Use the microphone. I, feel, I have the feeling that you are uh, just you were just answering my question. So so please okay. uh, move on. Ah, okay. If you don't, uh, I'll ask my question. Sorry. Okay. 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 Then uh, we were saying that uh, we wanted some inequality uh, um, from from this inequality for uh, that is valid for all quantum field theories. That this equality of uh, this uh, Markov property on the null plane, we want to have something. Now, uh, for a conformal field theory, uh, and then we can use conformal transformation to map a conformal. You can you can have a conformal transformation that maps the null plane on a null cone. Uh, it maps, for example, the the plane on spheres, so uh, you can have a, this mapping, and then you have the Markov property now for regions with boundary on a null cone. For a CFT, this only holds for a CFT. But this is more, more interesting and more non-trivial because now if you put a theory that is not a, a conformal theory, then it will, be no, it will not be saturated. It is only saturated in the case of a conformal theory. That is exactly the setup we, we were looking for. We were looking for inequalities that saturate for a conformal field theory and do not saturate when you are away from the conformal fixed point. Uh, then you have, a, also for a conformal field theory, you have this Markov property for the entropies on regions on the null cone. And in somehow what it tells you is that uh, the, these entropies, in order that they, they cancel the, 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 the strong subjective inequality, you, you can see that what it tells you is that the entropies of these regions have to be local on the surface, on the, on the boundary, on these gamma surfaces that determine the region. So it has to be a local functional, the entropy on the CFT has to be a local functional of these gammas. Uh, I, I'm not explaining how it, this is done, but uh, you can see that um, now you, you can see that your entropy for a CFT on this gamma is a, is a local function. It's so it's, it looks like uh, an action. It looks like an action in terms of this gamma, which will be the um, will be the, the field, let's say, for this action, uh, and uh, and it's a local action, and it, it also is Lorentz invariant because you can do Lorentz transformations. The map the null cone on itself is, is Lorentz invariant. And if you think it is an action on the two on the d minus two dimensional sphere, because this gamma depends on the on the angles, let's say on the angles. So it's an action on a d minus two dimensional sphere uh, for a, um, uh, that is also Lorentz invariant, is, and this Lorentz invariance on the sphere can be seen as a conformal transformation. So it's uh, then you need some action that uh, is uh, conformal invariant on the two on the d minus two dimensional sphere, and this this problem has been studied in the literature, also related to the to the A theorem in four dimensions. But here we need it in in d minus two dimension. Let's say we, we need to know the form of these uh, local actions that are conformal invariant and um, depend on this dilaton field. Let's say that is a logarithm of the radius here. So what the result is that uh, uh, looking at this, uh, this result, you can, you can see what is the 
most general form of this entropies for conformal field theory. And in three dimensions, you get just a constant term. So the constant term will be the same for any, for any region that you draw here in, in three dimensions. Uh, in, in also in all dimensions, it's always constant, this F. Uh, and in four dimensions, you already know that your entropy has a logarithmic term. So it has an area term, a logarithmic term. But the logarithmic term has to be compensated by something that depends on the derivatives of this curve in a precise way. So you can say, I, I have the area term, I have the logarithmic term, and then I need this expression for, for gammas, for different gammas, to be Lorentz invariant. How, how you do that, you have to add this term that depends on derivatives. And, and, and then you can also check holographically that you, you always, for a CFT, uh, you get this uh, universal expression of, of the entropies for any curve gamma on the null goal. Well, now then we have the um, we have the setup, and then we have to use the strong subjectivity for theories that are not conformal. This is the idea. We have to use the strong subjectivity on the null cone for theories that are not conformal, and see what we can get from there. Uh, and to have a, a result that is applied to spheres, we need that uh, we use spheres. In, in the strong subjectivity inequality. And we want also that the intersection and the union of the spheres are also spheres. But of course, this, this is not possible. If you have a, I, I, here I take, for example, this one, that is a boosted sphere on the null cone. But uh, if you cut the null cone with a plane in a Euclidean space, you get an, an, an ellipse, an ellipse. But here in the, in, the, in, the, in the Minkowski space, what you get is always a sphere. Strangely enough, it's a sphere. So this cuts by, uh, by spatial, spatial planes of, of, on the null cone are spheres. Uh, you can see that they are boosted spheres. And then you have to use a transformative with other boosted spheres that are rotated with respect to the, the, the previous one. And the way uh, you get to, to spheres is uh, for the intersection and union is to do it many times, to apply strong subjectivity many times. And then you can see that you can start with many rotated boosted spheres. And you end up with uh, the union of all these, the union of intersection of pairs, the union of intersection of three of them, and the, the final thing is the intersection of all of them. And then you have, uh, here you have N different terms. You start with N rotated boosted sphere, you have N terms here that look like these things that are marked here with a, with a strong uh, line. So it looks like, like this green sphere, but they, are, they have little wiggles. And uh, in the limit where n, the number of spheres is very large, these wiggles will go smaller and smaller. And you can say that somehow your, your different terms here are tending to spheres. Um, so if you take it really the large uh, n limit, uh, you, your inequality, you divide everything by n, your inequality is on, on the left-hand side, you have uh, the entropy of a sphere that is boosted that I write, I wrote it here like this thing where uh, the two R's are the, uh, it's just your geometry, it's just uh, the small radius here and the large radius here. And on the other, on the, on the left hand side, on the right hand side, I, we have an integral between these two different radius of a spheres of different radius multiplied by some geometrical number that is just, uh, you can compute from the geometry. And this, uh, these entropies, I put it here at tilde because they are entropies of these wiggle spheres. So you, 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 don't, know, you don't know at first if they can in the limit repla be replaced by entropy of a sphere. But suppose, suppose it's true. Suppose you can do the replacement of entropies by entropy of the spheres then you get an, an inequality for spheres only 
you can take the limit of these two sizes, this small radius and large radius going to C, going to be equal and expand this inequality and you get then this differential inequality, this differential inequality for entropies of spheres. That depends on the dimension of the space time there. The first thing you can do is to check that this inequality really saturates for a conformal field theory. So if you go to dimension two, for a conformal field theory, you have that the entropy is proportional to the Villasoro central charge and the logarithmic term. And this inequality is, is in fact saturated. What is non, non surprising because in two dimensions, we don't have wiggles. There are no wiggles, so no, no problem. In D equal to three, your Conformal field theory uh, uh, gives you entropies for circles that are, have an area term and have a constant term. And again, the, in the, inequality, the, the inequality is saturated. So it means that the wiggles do not contribute in three dimension in the limit. And in four dimensions, you have the area term and you have the logarithmic term. And if you apply this inequality, it gives you something different from zero. And it's, it's also positive, not negative. So something is wrong here. And what is wrong is just that the wiggles cannot be eliminated just replacing the wiggly sphere by sphere because there is a contribution of the wiggles. And the same happens in, in higher dimensions. There is a contribution from the wiggles and you can see from our previous expression of the uh, uh, entropies for these, uh, these uh, curves uh, in a conformal field theory that this term with the derivatives is going to give you a non-zero contribution for small wiggles. So this is the origin. But then um, if, if we want really to apply uh, this inequality for spheres, we have to take into account this contribution for the wiggles. You can do that directly or you can do the following. You can just replace in the inequality the entropy of the theory that has scales that have masses by the difference between the entropy of the same theory minus the entropy of the ultraviolet fixed point. Why you can do that? Because this satisfies Markov property. So it means that uh, the inequalities are trivial. Uh, so you can get to this inequality directly just uh, you can you you change nothing replay, uh, uh, subtracting this, but then one, once you have subtracted the the part of the wiggles, automatically you can uh, uh, um, convert wiggly spheres into into spheres because the the offending part is this thing that doesn't exist anymore. And you can also subtract uh, here not only the uh, ultraviolet contribution, but also diversion pieces that come from the massive perturbations. The diversion pieces are, are always Markovian, so it can, they can be subtracted uh, too. Uh, and then you have also, um, um, uh, you, can, you can worry about that uh, there, is, uh, that there, are, there could be non-local uh, non terms uh, coming from massive contributions to the wiggle itself, finite contributions. But you can see that these finite contributions will, uh, will uh, be proportional to some power of the, of the wiggles and will go to zero for small wiggles. So they do not contribute. So at the end, you get an inequality for the difference between the entropy of the, of the theory minus the entropy of the ultraviolet fixed point. That is this one. And this inequality can be, can be put in a more compact form for any dimension if you replace the radius of the sphere by the area. So radius to the power of D minus two in any dimension, and then you just get this. It's the second derivative of the difference of, of entropies is negative. So it means that the, this difference is a concave function of the area in any dimension. Any questions? Uh, I don't see questions. Okay. So then 
we come to the irreversibility theorems, the is applying this inequality to, to what we know about the, um, the entropies of spheres. So we have to compute the difference of entropies for a small radius. For a small radius, um, we have already subtracted here the ultraviolet theory. So basically everything is, is subtracted except the first non-local term that depends on this coupling constant at the ultraviolet that has some expression that is a power of the area, but it has to go to zero as, as the area goes to zero, it has to go to zero. So this, this subtracted entropy goes to zero. It's this curve, let's say I, I, here I'm, I'm writing this, this difference as a function of the radio say for uh, this blue line goes to zero. At the infrared, <clears throat> You, you get um, finite contribution or, or contributions to, to the area term, to the subleading, to the area term, et cetera, up to the final uh, uh, contribution is the change of the, of the logarithmic term because you are subtracting the ultraviolet minus the infrared here. You are always subtracting the ultraviolet fixed point. The difference of A times logarithm of the radius or the difference of the F term in the, in the odd dimensional case. So this is the last term in the expansion. Uh, and then you, you can apply um, the concavity property of this, of this function. And this, this concavity property has two consequences. <clears throat> the first one is that the slope here, uh, that the slope has to be negative. So, <clears throat> um, so it means that the, the, the area term gets renormalized negatively. So the, this, this delta mu that multiplies the area term gets renormalized negatively. And then, um, and then it, it just gives you that uh, the, the contribution to the area term gets normalized negative, but in two dimensions, the area term is just a logarithmic term. So it's a, it's a universal piece. And, it, and this, this inequality coincides with the C theorem. And the other hey, consequence- are, Sorry, Horacio, maybe. There are some questions from Juan La Madrid. Maybe he can Tell us what are the questions with using the microphone a bit long. Uh, okay, hello. So, so uh, I, I don't know too much about the, about all these topics, but the thing that I'm kind kind of concerned is that all the inequalities and relations we are arriving depend explicitly, for example, on derivatives and on coordinates and and things that are naturally not a invariance of in in a gravitational theory. For example, here in these equations appears a that are in the metric. I mean, in general, if we do a general coordinate transformation, we know that some expressions will look very different in many, many frames. So how do you know that the entropy, for example, has that behavior of second derivative behaves like this or like that, if we are, param if we are parameterizing the space time in a particular way? Uh, the, all this is forming Cauchy space. And we, we, I, I don't uh, have gravity. This is quantum field theory. There is no gravity here. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Of course uh, okay. 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 Mm. Yeah. So no, no, uh, Steve. But but for example, you you can write Minkowski like in a very nasty way if you do coordinate transformations. Yeah, you can always but it doesn't matter. Right? But it what, doesn't what, matter sorry? because the entropy is a function is a function of 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 the region that is a sphere, and then I can always write my entropy as a function of the radius of the sphere, right? So I, I choose that because it's convenient, let's say. Okay, <laughs> okay. You can, right? Uh, okay, <clears throat> okay so, so this little letter that appears over here is definitely an, an, an invariant of this sphere. It's basically the, the yeah, the, yes, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a geometric invariant. invariant of the sphere, right? Ah, yeah. uh, okay, 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 thank you. Yeah, it's not a coordinate, it's a, it's a radius. Okay, okay, so, thanks. So the, the second thing that uh, as, as uh, in the ultraviolet 
the, uh, this difference goes to zero, so it goes to zero. The second thing is that as a function is concave, it must be the case that if you compute here very, very far in the infrared, you have a linear term and you have a, also a subleading term. It, it must be that subleading terms allows you to compute the, uh, the high at the origin, the high at the origin of your, of your tangent, it has to be bigger than zero because otherwise it cannot be concave. And this inequality, uh, once you plug all these, these, uh, these expressions, you get the F theorem uh, in three dimensions and the A theorem in four dimensions. And for higher dimensions, it's just, uh, it's just that this uh, variation of the subleading term in the expression of the, of the entropy of spheres is, uh, gets normalized positively for all, all dimensions. So this, uh, this says that the, the theorem is expressed in, this term, in terms of the entropies um, says the same thing in all dimensions. It's, it really says the same thing in all dimensions, but it only reaches to say something about the universal pieces, the A or the F, for D equal two, three, and four. For higher dimensions, what happens is that it, it tells you something about the first and the second term, but these terms are dimensionful. This one is the area, of, area term, and the other one uh, is the subleading one that are not reaching to these uh, dimensionless coefficients. Uh, so it, it, it unifies all the reversibility theorems known up to today uh, that only get to dimension four. Uh, we have uh, all other proofs of these irreversibility theorems for dimension two and dimension four, um, but uh, this is the only proof up to now for dimension three, what is not quite uh, strange because in dimension three or, or in all dimension, this F quantity is quite a non-local thing. It's, it's, a, it's a coefficient on the, it's a constant coefficient of the entropy of a sphere or um, it's not related to a, a, an anomaly. So it's, it's more difficult to grasp from uh, correlation functions. Uh, okay, and, and then this, 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 this last thing is that the area term, the area, the normalization of the area term, this, this thing here, the area term get normalized negatively. What you, you can see that it's the same as to say that somehow the Newton constant gets normalized negatively because the area, the area in the entropy is, um, um, is related to, through Becker and Hawking formula. To, to, to the Newton constant. I, I will say more about uh, of this uh, perhaps in the next uh, lecture. Um, let me see. So one, one important thing that you obtain that th this is another thing I already like finished with the description of the reversibility theorems, but let me point to some important thing that it, it also follows from this um, saturation of a strong subadditivity, as, as it is a saturation of an inequality, is always more very powerful. And in this case, you can see from quantum information theory that the saturation of inequality is, uh, is equivalent to the saturation of the same inequality for the modular Hamiltonians. So the modular Hamiltonians are the logarithm of the density matrix is the is uh, was like expressing the density matrix as exponential of some Hamiltonian, let's say, like in the thermal case. So these operators satisfy, satisfy this equality. So now it's an operator equation, while this was just a number equation, an equation for a number. So it's very powerful. And somehow what it, it tells you is that um, when, you, when you see the geometric uh, implication of this, is that uh, I'm, I'm thinking here in the null plane, again, for this, this is saturated for, for regions with boundary in the null plane for any quantum field theory. So the same happens for this. So it means that uh, H, the, the model Hamiltonian is local, null line by null line. So it means that uh, if I, uh, I can 
I can uh, look at the modular Hamiltonian now for a region with a boundary on a null plane. And this, is, this expression has to be a sum for all null lines. This is the transversal coordinate. So it's a sum over a transversal coordinate of something that depends on the null line, on each null line. And this piece that depends on the null line, I just I can calibrate using the known result for the Rindler space. So I get the formula for all regions, uh, and it's also local, as in the case in, on the in the in the Rindler case, this is this gamma is just zero. It's just a city at the at the corner. So um, we have a, a, a generalization of the of the Rindler formula. It's also local in the stress tensor, and you can also do that for conformal field theories in the null cone. They said they said they find some 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 fixed algebra these operators for all gammas. Uh, but even if it is local, it has some difference with respect to the 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 Rindler case in that. These operators are, are, are local only written in the null surface. If I if I write this operator outside of the null surface, it will be it will be non-local. While in the case of the Rindler case, as this is a flux of a current because it's a it's a, um, uh, generator of, of a symmetry, then you can write it in any Cauchy surface and it will always be local. But here it's only local on the null plane. I will talk more about this in the next lecture, where you can you can obtain some some uh, inequalities for the the energies from 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 this expression. There is a question. Yeah. Uh, these modular Hamiltonians are computed for the non-cyclic vacuum state. No, these modular Hamiltonians are computed for uh, the vacuum state. For the vacuum state. I, I, the vacuum state is cyclic for any algebra, except for any algebra of a, of a, of a region with has, with has volume, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, it's just a model Hamiltonian for the, for the vacuum state. And the region gamma, the region gamma does have volume. This region gamma is a normal region, but these ones are infinitely large regions, I say. It's like, it's like a generalization of Rindler wedge but the form is the boundary. So, uh, well, my, my last, uh, my last uh, transparency is about what, what can we say about the interpretation of, 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 of this C theorem, of this uh, irreversibility theorem. What the irreversibility theorem tells us that something is lost from the, we travel it to the infrared as we go to the uh, along the romanization group flow, but it has been always like um, very very obscure what is really lost, because the the naive idea that we are tracing out degrees of freedom in, as in the Wilson romanization group flow ideas that we are taking out degrees of freedom of ultraviolet to go to the infrared. It's not really correct in the, the it's not really the, the thing that this is measuring because we can also trace out degrees of freedom in the conformal field theory and nothing changes. So it's not uh, degrees of freedom are always infinite in, infinite in quantum field theory. So it's not the number of degrees of freedom that is lost. So it's something else. And uh, one could have hoped that uh, expression in terms of entropies. Uh, or, or ideas on quantum information would give us a hint of what is really lost. Uh, we have only a partial idea, but really the, we haven't get really to the, to the point. So there is no, this is an open question. But one thing you can see is that you have something like this. This is the, the setup of this, uh, the geometric setup of these theorems. You have uh, two regions that are, you can choose them to be very small because they are like uh, very near the null lines. So they are very small. Intersection is also very small while the union is very large. So you are doing uh, big, 
why is that? Because the triangle inequalities in Minkowski space are very badly uh, broken. So this is small, this is small, small, and this is large. And then uh, you can say, well, what happens if I know the density matrix here? I know the density matrix here for a small regions, and this also for a small region. Can I reconstruct the density matrix for this large region? And for a CFT, due to the Markov property, you can do that because of what I have already said. If, if I have uh, strong subadditivity saturated, I have saturation of, of modular Hamiltonians, and I can compute this out of the others. So it turns out that the density matrix in the large region is just an expression in terms of the density matrices in the smaller ones. So uh, somehow it tells you that um, <clears throat> the reconstruction from, from is possible uh, in the conformal case. And this is, this is what is broken when the thing is not conformal. You cannot use this formula anymore to reconstruct the state in larger regions. But it, it, it's missing the, something that tells us uh, how the uh, romanization group charges this F and A really measure uh, this failure of reconstruction. Okay, I think I, 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 I finished. Okay, Th thank you. Uh, okay, there is a question by Pedro Jorge Martinez. I think he can tell us what is the question by the microphone. Um, can you go back to the model of Hamiltonians you just computed in the last slide? Uh, I understood that for the null plane, you could map any gamma to the to the x-axis to, to resemble the the Rindler wedge. Uh, so I don't quite understand what the gamma dependence on these modular Hamiltonians are because I, I would have expected that all of them are the same for for any gamma. Yeah, well, the, in, in fact, let me, let me put it in the, in the picture. What I'm doing is just saying that for each null line, for each null line, I, I am adding in the y directions have modular Hamiltonians that are computed for each null line. And for each null line, you have just the Rindler result. But the Rindler result displaces it from the origin to this point gamma. So I have to. I have to put this uh, null parameter minus gamma in such a way that this, this thing here vanishes exactly at the vertex, at the vertex of the region, right? So if, if I if I have it for the for the for the render, I don't have this gamma. So it means that the coefficient of the stress tensor vanishes at zero. Vanishes there. It has to vanish for a render wedge, it vanishes here, coefficient, and here I have to, it has to vanish here. So it's just a, it's a, it's just a translation. It's a null translation of the null of the um, uh, render result. Okay, so, so they all have different modular Hamiltonians, but they have the same uh, entropy. Ah, in, okay, in the yeah, sense, yeah, yeah. Okay, in the, the sense that, that you can boost them all to, to have the same entropy. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. OK, yeah. thank you. OK. I don't see other questions. So maybe we can close here and thank Horacio again. Thank you. And reconvene in 15 minutes. Uh, thank you. Hi, Horacio. Hi. Hi. Hi, it's Artisher. Hi. Sorry. Oh, hi there. <laughs> hi, hi. Yeah, unfortunately, I had to miss your talk yesterday. Yeah. That's okay. mother meeting. But thanks. It's very nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me, so I.
Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine. You? Uh, not bad. Uh, sort of surviving. Uh, <laughs> oh. You have a normal. I mean, how is the academics working these days? No, no, no. Nothing. The, actually, they, they opened the university. Yes. Uh, at first, and in three weeks, there are 800 cases. Ah. And they ah. shut it off. They oh, shut it off. Yeah. Oh, bad. Uh, and there are many, there were many, many classes. This part is not recorded, right? No, no. Oh, I, okay. Well, I think so. Yeah, I, got, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah, there were many, many clusters. And Actually, they they opened it in a hybrid mode. You yeah. know, some students on the yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Some, some at the at home, and mine was fortunately at home because some students asked. Um, uh -huh. Oh, somebody says it is recorded. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, we are not <laughs> saying anything. Secret. Okay, we didn't say anything wrong. So yeah, yeah. and uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh,
<laughs> but we didn't say anything wrong. So, no. okay. Let me try to do share screen. Yeah, we have still five minutes. Okay. Okay, let's see. Ah, everything is yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, so, but yeah, then they made this very wise decision and mm -hmm. they moved everything online, but it, it literally blew both at North Carolina State as well as at UNC, University of North Carolina. Yes, yes. And, um, well, in Italy, we have to see because they are going to open university in a kind of, yeah, the same hybrid mode. Some students will go to the class, some other will stay in remote. I think the problem is as long as they, some students stays in the dorm, dormitories, you know, the in US there are these uh, fraternities, yeah. sororities. Uh, it's extremely risky in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. <sighs> But I, I am not any, you know, it's not something that I know very well, so. Uh, so you are lecturing these days? Yes, I am actually just after this lecture. Uh, I have uh, also, you know, lecture at my own university. Mm -hmm. But the difficult part is not that actually. The difficult part is I have two young kids. Uh, and then they started their schools too, uh, but it is completely, at this stage it is online, but it means that, you know, there are huge expectations from parents, you know, how uh, can you teach a 60 year old to use everything on the computer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's quite unrealistic and um, so, happened is that I, you know, I decided to accept the situation a little bit and, you know. Well, what can you do? Yeah. Yeah. How are things with you in Italy? In Italy, Italy? yeah, they are, uh, they were more or less facing the same problems, right? People, university are going to open presumably end of this month uh, in a kind of hybrid mode, as you are saying. Schools also for kids and uh, there are various issues, of course, the same that you face. <laughs> yeah. Not clear, even the transportations, how people to allow, you know, the buses, you know, all kind of problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And- uh, very, very, very difficult times, yeah. Uh, Hi, Mithal. Hey, Atish. Nice to how see you. you. Good. How are you? Okay, good. Oh. So it looks like the lectures are going fine. I... I actually follow your example. In one of your first lectures, you said, I will use this uh, hybrid thing, you know, uh, write on things and, you know. If yeah, it works know. well, actually, because then you can cover some material but you can also have interaction otherwise it becomes yeah 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 so mm -hmm. if there is question you can draw something at least and yeah nowadays yeah this tablet is very useful it's becoming yeah, yeah 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 and uh, i actually got this tablet just uh, two three weeks ago fortunately yeah, me too me too you know i bought it basically just for to start, oh, yeah. I, I see, know. I see. But <laughs> it is it is quite useful, honestly. Yeah, I, this notability so, I use on iPad, notability. Well, yeah, yeah I use uh, something called Good Notes. Good Notes, yeah. yeah. Pretty good, good too. Yeah. So nice. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think the lectures are being going well. I, I, also, I unfortunately I had to miss your lecture because I had some other meetings, but no worries. Yeah. No worries. Uh, but I think the students are quite engaged it looks like and i hope so yeah. yeah you know of course we all wish that we were there um, delivering these lectures at 
you know, ICTP. It's a very beautiful place. Yeah, it's a beautiful love... place. Yeah, we cannot take you for nice coffee or nice uh, Italian dinner. Or... You know, I came, I came there quite a few, some years ago. Uh -huh. yeah. it's, it's, it's a nice time to swim in the Adriatico. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where are you from, Mithat? Turkey. You're from Turkey. Okay. Turkey. Yeah, where? From where in Turkey? Um, Istanbul? No. No, no, no. I lived in Ankara quite a bit, but originally I am from a fairly small town in uh -huh. Konya. Uh, within Konya, a small town, you know. But I lived uh, my almost all of the school life in Ankara. Uh -huh. <laughs> Actually, I have a I have an interesting story about it. You know, when I was at the university, I used to see these ICTP schools. <laughs> you know, and you know, I was thinking I should go to one of these. You know, only, you know it was sort of admiration. You see these uh, fantastic names lecturing there and things like that, and it was something uh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, and now you are here giving lectures. <laughs> when I had this invitation, I, I, I more or less immediately within my norms accepted because you know. Usually I cannot travel much because of the school age kids and working spouse and everything. But you know, this one. <laughs> of course, I'm so glad. Yes, it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Visit ICTP. You know, you should visit ICTP. Yeah, ICTP is very special to yeah, me. Yeah, you should come here when you're when maybe you are a visitor or for some long term visit. You should come. Yeah. Okay. I think okay, we can start maybe. maybe. Yeah, should, should I start? Yeah. Okay. Okay, second lecture by Mita. Okay, so this is the second lecture and it will cover uh, basics of resurgence and Nefshet symbols in quantum mechanical systems. Most of the lectures I will talk about uh, these double well, which has instant on events as well as uh, periodic potential. Okay, this is my goal to Talk through most of the lectures, but it is not um, uh, that boring if you wish. So I will essentially consider two systems. One of them is this uh, usual bosonic system. And the other one is this bosonic system coupled to Grassmann valued fields. Psi. And there, and uh, here, the, for the Grassmann value fields, fermions, let's call them fermions, um, I can take an index i1 through nf. So th that means I am considering an f species. But if you are, for example, if nf equal one, this corresponds to supersymmetric quantum mechanics. And that transition is really, you know, if this thing describes a spin zero particle, you know, you can think just one fermion associated with spin one half particle. And if you have an F equal one, you know, um, and an F equal two is some sense uh, one half cross one half uh, internal spin particle. So a, a system like that. And Actually, it is well known that this system is supersymmetric for NF equal one, but for NF greater than, than one theories, these are also extremely special. These are related to something called quasi-exactly solvable uh, systems, quasi-exactly solvable. It means that if either exponential plus W or minus W is normalizable, exactly as in supersymmetric theory, the lowest NF states are exactly solvable, regardless of what W is. And this is great bonus. In supersymmetry, there is only one state which is exactly solvable in supersymmetric theory. And in these theories, lowest NF states are exactly solvable. And this makes them extremely interesting playgrounds. Now, what you can do here, since uh, Grassmann fields only couples to, uh, are only functions of time, you can essentially quantize them. And this term will disappear because there is no space derivative or anything like that. 
and this term will produce some uh, modification of the of the potential. So you will get some Hamiltonian systems, many Hamiltonian systems, with potential W prime square plus zeta g W double prime. Zeta is some integer from minus nf to plus nf. And g is small parameter. So the thing that you should pay attention uh, is that this part of the potential here is classical. Cool. And I can always think G and H bar on the same footing. Let's say when there is a G here, you can always think that there is an extra H bar. So this part of the potential is quantum. So there is essentially an H bar there along with G, if you wish. So. And so uh, the reason we call it, uh, it is quantum is the specter of G, but it is, you can also think of it as an effect of integrating out fermions. Uh, so when you integrate out fermions at one loop, it will induce terms like that. And this thing generates, if this red thing is classical, so this thing generates a quantum tilting of the potential for the, for the periodic potential, it generates something like double sine Gordon, but again, this tilting is not classical. It's very important that it is, this tilting is, has both classical and quantum parts, okay? So the reason I consider this class of theories is because when you discuss the semi-classical configuration in these systems, uh, they have a very close bearing to quantum field theory in semi-classical regimes. When we consider, you know, now nowadays we understand that even in non-supersymmetric quantum field theories, we can construct semi-classical regimes by non-traditional compactifications on R3 times S1. And we can, you can do either QCD, young Mills, or QCD with various representations of fermions, okay? Then when you discuss theories with fermions, this kind of, uh, quantum mechanical uh, uh, models provide an extremely good analogy. Actually, some of the discussion of critical points uh, settles, especially something called critical points at infinity that I will cover, I will, uh, cover in today's lecture will play a very important role. Okay. Now, I will make a first very gentle introduction, very easy, at least first five, six, seven pages. But then things will start to get more sophisticated, more sophisticated, and it will produce some very interesting results, okay? So let me start with something super basic, textbook level, but then uh, I'll go to some much more interesting thing. Think of double well potential, okay? Uh, with two harmonic degenerate vacua here and there. So we know that uh, the ground, so the system is a parity symmetry which commutes with Hamiltonian and the ground state is left right symmetric, it is parity symmetric. The first excited state is uh, a parity odd combination. If you study perturbation theory at any order in this well, and I will advertise a mathematical package not on this page but in the upcoming page, page by Tim Suleiman Passage that you can actually study perturbation theory here very easily at 500 order within two hours. If you want 50 order, it is in four or five seconds, okay? And it is symbolic calculation. It is uh, analytic symbolic calculation by using a slightly different version of the perturbation theory. Instead of Riley Schrodinger perturbation theory, you use the bender Wu, and I will come to that and there will perturbation theory. You can study perturbation theory, but the per in perturbation theory, left energy in the left well and on the right well are lifted up exactly in the same way. You know, the degeneracy remains to all orders in perturbation theory. And taking into account these tunneling events, you can 
show that vacuum is unique and it is this uh, parity even state. Uh, and the gap between the ground state and first excited state is just an instant on factor and instant on fact instant on H happens to be one over six in this example, okay? So, and as I said, these instantons are tunneling amplitude. So you can calculate the transition amplitude from left well to the right well. And it is described in the Euclidean pet integral. And you can think of the Euclidean vacuum as a, as a beginning, as a dilute gas of instantons, but it's maybe call it uh, some grand canonical ensemble or cluster expansion for the instantons for reasons that you will see. And this is capable of producing this instanton, anti-instanton gas is capable of producing properties of the ground state, first excited state, and uh, few, uh, some low, lower, order, low order states, okay? uh, quite equally. Now, uh, however, in the, from the perspective of this lecture, I should make some remarks. This instanton factor, of course, this is again triviality, but I mentioned because there are students here, if you try to tailor expand this exponential minus one over G square, of course it has an essential singularity G square equals zero. So you cannot tailor expand it. It is zero plus zero plus zero ad infinitum, okay? So that means that this factor, this gap here cannot be captured by perturbation theory. It is intrinsically non-perturbative, okay? But the interesting thing is, of course, this series here is asymptotic and divergent. And as I will uh, immediately show and show in many other examples, this divergence is controlled uh, by, uh, by the saddles that perturbation theory can talk with. Okay, so if you, um, if you do Borel resummation of the perturbation theory, one obtains that, remember from my previous lecture, I drew this error and order of perturbation theory, order of perturbation theory, error gets less and less and there is an optimal order and is around one over G square where the error is minimum. The, er the minimal error is actually in this system is this amount, which is actually exponential of two times instant connection, not one instant connection. Actually, in this example, perturbation theory uh, cannot directly talk with an instanton in the sense of usual resurgence because the vacuum has a discrete topology. And because of this discrete topology, uh, the perturbative vacuum cannot uh, directly talk with uh, with an instanton. The first thing that it can talk with is an instanton anti-instanton, and instanton anti-instanton action is of this form. Okay. Now, and we immediately learn that the large orders of perturbation theory know something interesting about instanton anti-instanton. Uh, pairs. Uh, so, and this is discovered fairly early in the early 80s by Bogomolny and Zinjustan independently, okay? And I will make these things extremely precise, uh, uh, you know, these rough picture. Um, now, this is double well. I put it so that, you know, uh, people will have some immediate familiarity. Now I can consider this periodic potential, you know. Again, there are instantons, anti-instantons, I, I bar. I will provide a picture first, then I will go to mathematical formalism of resurgence and left shed symbols. If you look at, a, for example, a very good textbook uh, like uh, Coleman or Marinho, uh, you will see that usually uh, this kind of thing is presented as a dilute gas of one instanton. So you will see that there is an instanton here, another instanton, then anti-instanton, anti-instanton, so on and so forth. But 
there is a more uh, realistic picture and it is the following. And I should emphasize here, Instanton has some characteristic size and it is much less than typical distance between instantons, okay? So this allows you to do this thing called dilute instanton guess approximation. And I will even make this approximation very precise, but I want to give you first an impression of, of the, a, a cartoon of what I will describe, okay? But actually, if you do this a, a bit more precisely, apart from these instant tones and stuff like that, once in a while, there is an anti-instant tone immediately followed by an instant tone or an instant tone immediately followed by an instant tone. And the characteristic size of these objects, paired up objects, is much larger than I will much, I will uh, derive this much larger than the instanton size, but it is much smaller than, much smaller than typical separation between instantons, okay? So if you are thinking this as sort of a single object, this is some sort of composite, like, you know, atom versus molecule kind of thing, but never think of these things as particles or, you can think of them as particles, but then you are really thinking a classical grand canonical ensemble. So never think that they annihilate or anything like that. that that's not accurate. But a more realistic picture is that there are these pairs of instanton and anti-instanton, uh, and even these triples. And there are all sorts of these interesting things you know, and this sort of dilute gas is not composed of the instantons and anti-instantons, but there are also two events, three events, correlated to events, correlated three events, so on and so forth, okay? Any questions so far? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Is there a way to isolate these uh, three instanton, two instanton events from the rest, like by gauging some symmetry or something like that? Um, you know, not not by gauging by some symmetry, but I will make them extremely precise. Actually, you know, in a moment now, I will answer your question. If okay, I do not then. answer, ask again. Okay. Okay. Now. Let me cover some mathematical basic basics of instantons. When we are given an action like that, if you wish, there is an overall one over G up front, okay? So there is a kinetic term and there's a potential term. And I wrote potential term for convenience as W prime square, um, maybe one half W prime square. And you can use this uh, Bogomolny's factorization, complete it, to a perfect square plus minus something. And this part is of course positive definite, the way it is defined. And the uh, action is greater than this delta W between the extrema divided by G, okay? And the saturation equals zero sign corresponds to an instanton uh, or anti-instanton, okay? So if you take W to be like that, then instanton is a configuration which interpolates in the inverted potential. In this case, inverted potential is same as potential. So sorry about that, but instanton is a configuration. Let's say this is zero and two pi is a configuration which uh, goes from here to there and uh, where uh, tau is, uh, is a configuration like that, okay? So it's an exact solution to the Euclidean uh, equation of motion. It's actually first order Euclidean equation of motion, okay? And there is some part of story that, um, that I assume that you are partly familiar, okay? So, um, but I will not need it. Actually, if you want to be more precise about what the contribution of the instanton to the pet integral is, there are parts and bits to the story. And it is very well explained both in Coleman as well as Marino. You can go there and read it. But the only thing I will use is that instanton is exponential is instanton 
and there is some perturbative fluctuations around it. But in reality, the story is more involved. These prefactors are interesting. For example, this factor, so instanton position is actually a moduli. Instanton can be anywhere on real line. It can be here or it can be here. It doesn't matter. And the action is independent of that moduli. And this J is some uh, Jacobian uh, associated with that moduli. Moduli is part of the field space um, of this bosonic zero mode. This M determinant, M, M object is determinant of the fluctuation operator. So fluctuation operator, you can calculate by expanding the action to second order. And it is in the instant on background minus T square over D tau square V double prime. And here you have to insert instant on solution. So this is the, this is the operator that we have to deal with. And if you take the instant on, the potential becomes like the, the very fairly standard Perchteller type uh, potential. And it turns out that it has an automatic zero mode, which is instant on solution time derivative of the instant on solution. Remember instant on solution was this profile. And if you take its derivative, it will be something like that. And this is an exact zero mode solution to this uh, potential and of this form. And this PI is the perturbative fluctuations, all order perturbative fluctuation around this instanton, okay? And, but to find this perturbation theory, you have to work with the Green's functions in the instanton background. It is by no means a trivial thing. It is fairly difficult task, okay? Um, and this determinant, uh, inverse of the determinant, can be calculated by some Gelfand Gelblom, but all of the information here, uh, you can uh, check Marino's book, all of the information here is encoded into classical solution. So this that already in classical solution. So by looking to the, uh, the data in the classical solution, you can determine that, that actually in my notes, I wrote the final formula, which is very simple. But we should not be under a lamppost, okay? So you should ask the following question. Do instantons always contribute when they are exact solution? And this is not a canonical question that you will see in textbooks, okay? And this is actually, not a very easy question. So if you take a triple well like this, we, you know, and in consecutive vacua, harmonic frequencies are, let's say, omega one, omega one, omega three, omega one, omega two, and omega three. You can ask, obviously this system for whatever it is worth, if you flip it around, you know, it has instant on solutions, call it I one, I2, and you can ask the following question. Do instantons, which are exact solutions, exact settles in the problem, always contribute to observables in quantum mechanics? And it may be surprising for you to hear this, but the answer is actually no. I am asking instantons per se. Is there a contribution of order of exponential S instanton in this system? For example, if you look to the spectrum, here, omega two is supposedly lowest. If you look to non-perturbative contribution and omega one is slightly higher and omega two is three is slightly higher. Now you see that there are some strange things going on. Uh, for example, there is no state for omega two to mix with, you know, lowest state here to mix with on the left. And actually, if you do the calculation here, the interesting object is really this determinant to the power minus one half. There is a determinant of fluctuation operator to the power minus one half. And determinant is actually in the instant on background, determinant of M hat is actually infinity, okay? And determinant one half is of course zero. And generically, instantons do not contribute to observables at the leading order, exponential S instant on order. And in this kind of problems, you know, as long as two consecutive wells are not at the same frequency, instant on will not contribute at, at leading order. And Sorry. ironically, yeah. 
There is a question, a bit long question by Juan La Madrid that maybe he can tell us what it is. Uh, okay. Something like WKB approximation, the exponent is just the action variable J, phase space. Ah, instantons are of course intimately related to WKB. So, and so indeed the exponent in WKB from, you know, the integral from here to there, or let me say exponent in the WKB for integral from here to there, let me call it A to B uh, is instant on action. And I, I asked this friend for asking the question because actually I will tell you today the story for uh, instantons and all orders semi-classics around instantons uh, and resurgence. Actually, WKB is a, you know, it is a long-standing approach, but it had seen a revival in the last decade or so. And now there are many good physicists and mathematicians working on it. WKB can actually be made exact by using resurgence. For example, you can map Schrodinger to Riccati, but I decided not to talk about it during my lectures. And you know you can solve it iteratively, and resurgence play a prominent role. Look for exact WKB, and you will uncover most of the stuff that I do in this lecture in that language. But and from WKB, there is a way to go to exact quantization conditions and stuff like that. Yes, they are intimately related. WKB and instanton anal analysis are extremely intimately related. At the end of the day, they are describing the same. Okay, there is another question, maybe I can read it. Is this fact of instant or non-contributing related to whether we can deform the contour in order to go through the saddle? I don't think so. Um, their contribution is really, this is coming from the quadratic fluctuation operator around the instant on here. I drew quickly, for example, for double well or periodic potential, the quadratic fluctuation operator is this, okay? Uh, it is this symmetric double well. Uh, I'm sorry, symmetric uh, this Perchteller potential. But if the frequency on the left and on the right are not equal, okay? This picture here, the asymptotes are really omega one square and omega one square. So for this system, the, for instant on here, for example, here, that potential will look like this, okay? So the, the left asymptote will not be equal to right asymptote. And if you calculate that determinant, you see that in that determinant, there is a normalization com compared to harmonic vacua and you have to use one of the harmonic vacua. If you calculate this thing, uh, this determinant uh, to the power m hat that m zero to the power minus one half, there will be a factor. So please go to, to, to my uh, you know, lecture notes. I explain this there. Um, now, okay. This is sort of basic introduction to instantons. It took half of the lecture. I'm in a bit in trouble, but let me go to now more precise story, okay? Now, as I said, uh, you can do perturbation theory and you can actually, a much better way to do perturbation theory is to do by the method of Van der Boel. And this is discovered in 69 and by now it should have been it should have been a textbook material and the only textbook that discusses Van der Boe technique is the book of Konishi and his co-author and but it doesn't also discuss in generality but this should have been a textbook material by now okay uh, my friends and collaborator Tim Suleiman Pasic wrote a quote and if you want to calculate perturbation theory at 100th order, it is really a minute. 
minute work. You press computer and it gives you a time root order. And you can write down perturbation theory for first state, second state, third state, and each one of them will take you, you know, if you want you know, less than a minute. And if you want to calculate 500 order to do asymptotics, you have to wait two hours or something like that, but you can be patient. And I am impatient, so I only want 10 orders, okay, so from 10. And you can actually study perturbation theory as a function of level number and the coupling. And you see, it starts with harmonic approximation, okay? Then there is an order G contribution, which multiplies a polynomial of N plus one half square. Order G square contribution N plus one half cube, G to the four N plus one half to the five. So there's a structure to it. Now, if you look to large orders of the perturbation theory, of course it grows uh, factorially for this harmonic level N. And it is, uh, N is order of perturbation theory and there is this N factorial here, N plus capital two N factorial. And if I just write down for the ground state, the perturbation theory also grows there factorially and I can find, uh, you know, n minus one factorial, n minus two factorial, lower factorial growths, and they have this structure, okay? Very good. And ah, by the way, this Mathematica package is available in the Wolfram library, and people started to using it uh, even in different problems nowadays. Uh, for me, it's very exciting. You should know that I am a, co-author, but I only discussed it with Tim. So, and uh, I didn't do any coding. I cannot do, you know, it requires some ability that I do not have. But now, okay, this is perturbation theory. Okay, this is all very nice and uh, everything, but it cannot resolve degeneracies. And let us go back to the instanton uh, picture. So if you, the instanton equations are intrinsically nonlinear. So if you take two instanton configuration, instanton, instanton, or instanton, anti-instanton, and form these linear uh, superposition, it is no longer a, an exact solution, okay? So you can calculate the action of these instanton plus anti-instanton, plug it into i i as a function of tau, plug in tau one, two, which depends on separation, you can plug into the action and you see that if you have instant on instant on, there is an interaction between them, which is sort of repulsive. Okay, A is positive, A is a positive. It is coming from the instant on data. If you are considering instant on anti instant on, it looks like attractive uh, in, in this way. Okay, so, but these are just words and do not be fooled by words, okay? So th this word attractive caused many confusion in the past, you know, 70s, 80s, if you look to literature, even uh, sometimes today, okay? So, and we will make it much more precise, okay? So as I said, these are the interaction between instantons and it tells you that, so the instanton action for two instanton also depends on the separation between them a little bit, okay? And this direction, tau one, two, is called quasi-moduli uh, direction. So remember, instanton position was a moduli, the other instanton is also moduli, but when they are together, it is no longer an exact solution and the se this separation between them, but even the word separation uses some intuition which is not precisely correct. Separation between them, we would say, is a, is a, uh, is a quasi-moduli. Uh, co quasi zero mode direction, okay? So what do we do with the instanton expansion? So if you go ahead and in the beta limit, expand the partition function, there will be ground state. There will be this C is instanton factor. There will be instanton contribution and at second order, there will be instanton square, but there will be these interactions entering to the game. And at third order, there will be three body interactions, but we will be ignorant of part of it. And you can write a cluster expansion like this for the instanton, okay? And you can actually 
sum up these series and find the contribution of instantons to ground state energy, for example. And when sometimes people say one instanton contributing to ground state energy, it is really you are summing over infinitely many instantons in a grand canonical ensemble in this uh, dilute gas to the partition function. So infinitely many instanton contributing to partition function maps to one instanton contribution to the energy. This is because of the relation between vacuum energy and the partition function per se. And the interesting thing is, of course, this thing, if there's an instanton, instanton bar, instanton square is a correlated event. And then there are these strange things, instanton, anti-instanton, which I will define and which turns out to be ambiguous, multifold ambiguous, okay? Okay. Now, let me be a little bit more precise. Instead of working with R, let me compactify it on S1 beta. So I compactify the Euclidean time to a circle, beta, which is large. And I consider the partition function, which is a state sum over the Hilbert space, okay? Now, you can imagine that if you have an instant on here, anti-instant on there, indeed, if this is tau separation, by the way, this is due to, I think, Zinjustan. Then, okay. If tau is the separation here from the other direction, there is beta minus tau, which is also a legit separation. And the instant on anti-instant on interaction is modified like this at finite beta. Okay, and to find the instanton anti-instanton correlated events, you have to calculate these quasi over this quasi uh, zero mode direction, and and it is this integral that you have to do. But there is something interesting here. Now, there are two terms in the exponent. One over g is there. Okay, one over g is here. And you can see that this integral has actually, unlike this thing on R, has a critical point. And the critical point is at tau of critical is equal beta over two. We call this beta over two, okay? And this subtraction is to remove uh, instant on anti instant on uncorrelated pairs. So if you forget about it, that will come out naturally, but I do not want to double count and you subtract it, um, but it's not that important. So now the interesting thing is there is a, uh, did I put, okay. There is a critical point here, okay. Now, for the instant on anti instant on, if you look to the steepest descent direction from this critical point, okay, let's say this is this tau plane, there is this critical point, but if you look to the steepest descent direction, it is actually this, not the real axis, not the usual separation between them. So the so called separation do get complexified and you move to the complex domain. This is the this picture is the, this part is zoomed in here. And the, the interesting thing is there is this critical point tau zero, but it also has these mirrors. And you are very, uh, you are very close to Stokes line here. I resolved it by map making G a little bit complex, but uh, you, you see that the main thing that you should see at this stage is that this tau is actually needs to be an integral over the complex domain, okay? Now, if you do this integrals, uh, there is a question. It says, you said multiple instant on configurations are not exact solutions, yeah. so they can't be settled, right? Why yeah. do you care about them? Very good question. And I will answer your question. Instant on anti-instant on, is, a, is actually not a critical point at finite separation. It is something called critical point at infinity. But the interesting, I will come to this notion again and again, and I will describe it much better. For now, I will just tell you the results, okay? 
In a moment, I will answer this question much more precisely. You will see that more important than the critical point itself are their timbals. And actually for this critical point, the only contribution that is coming from the critical point is this part. In this case, this part is coming from the timbal. Okay, this part is coming from critical point at infinity. This part is associated with either, you know, this cycle or since you are on the Stokes line, uh, yeah, it is associated with this part. The remainder minus gamma minus log A over G is associated with this cycle here uh, throughout, okay? So you have to care about a lot about this notion critical point at infinity. This thing is not discussed in the textbook. There is a brief mention of it. I will, I will describe it in a moment much more, but there is a brief mention of it in Coleman's lecture, critical point at infinity. But as far as I can see, it is probably even more important, not less important than instanton. And it has some very odd features that I will describe in this lecture. Thank you for the question. But now let me go back to the end result of my calculation. I calculate instanton anti instanton amplitude. There is this ambiguity plus minus i pi. And there is this real part, which is log a over g. You see that from this quasi zero mode integral, we obtain the log a over g. So the expansion is not only an expansion in g exponential minus one over g, it there also has terms like log one over g. These terms are sometimes called trans-series monom trans monomials, okay? And if you want to be, if you want to write down fluctuations around this instant one, you can also include them. There is order G, order G square, so and so forth. But now you have to go back and remember our large order analysis of perturbation theory. And you see exactly these factors, same as those, even signs, of course, if signs must match as well. And this instant on two instant on action appearing is the determining the growth of the of the of the impact variable. So you learn something very deep. This theory is not Borel summable, but it is what we would call borel lecal summable. So the imaginary part of the Borel resummation of the perturbation theory cancels exactly with the imaginary part of the instanton anti instanton uh, amplitude. I should, uh, I want to make an historical remark. Actually, Bogomolny and Zyustan in the early 80s derived this term and not this part, okay, not the fluctuations, not lower order expansions, and this term here. But, and ironically, their work, at least among experts, was known. Um, people knew about it. And despite that, it wasn't an unknown paper hidden somewhere. You know, you, you go to some respectable reviews and they are mentioned. But the thing, the problem was their methods of derivation did not convince people sufficiently that there was something very profound there. Zinjustan continued to work actually. He did obtain very remarkable results following this intuition. But this lower order structure, for example, which tells you that this cancellation happens when you include all the fluctuations around instanton and anti instantons, as well as lower order uh, growth uh, and factorial growth uh, in large orders of perturbation theory. This is something that uh, Gerald Dunn and I obtained in into 14 in our work. Okay? Now, let me come back to my other example, supersymmetry, quasi exactly solvable and in between stuff. And I said, there are these tiltings and, and uh, quantum tiltings, not classical. It's very important that they are not classical, okay? For classical one, I have to give another lecture or, or uh, Giovanni there, or Giovanni Villadoro or Marco Serone and their friends can give another lecture, you know, they did some very nice work with the classical tilting. And now the interaction between instanton and anti-instanton, now you can go from here to there, but there is no, uh, there is no state there, okay? So 
there is a penalty when you go to that side, you know, for an, uh, oh, here there is an instanton, anti-instanton. So there is a penalty to be here. And in higher dimensional language, there is an interaction coming from fermion zero mode exchange in higher dimensions. Sorry, Mitat, one yes. question. Can you state again if the final result uh, is summable? Summable or, or not? not? How about higher instanton? This is also a very good question. I said that it is not Borel summable, but it is Borel Lecal summable. So there is a trans series which is meaningful and actually up to order exponential for S instanton contributions, we actually well defined the semi-classical expansion at this stage. But as you say, we didn't include these higher order terms. I can actually prove the cancellation of the higher order terms by using a question that a friend of yours asked earlier by using WKB, exact WKB methods. And uh, this is actually done by uh, Delabert, Dillinger, and Tom uh, in, that, uh, in that language, but these are mathematicians, so it is not an awfully familiar language. So it can be done all orders, cancellations, but it is not as obvious. And in PET integral, it is much harder, okay? Um, now, go back to this example. Okay, there is this uh, tilting. And again, there is a classical interaction between instanton and anti-instanton or instanton and instanton. And there is a part coming from the fermion zero mode attached to these instantons, okay? Now, okay, I need to divide this page to two. And half of the page concerns instanton, instanton, and the other page concerns instanton, anti instanton. This answers a question that a friend asked. So, this is the quasi zero mode integration that you need to do. The critical point is at beta over two. As you take beta, it goes to infinity. This is the notion of concept of critical point at infinity. And you have to determine the cycle, steepest descent cycle attached to it. Okay? So, for the instanton instanton, which is easy part of the story, the steepest descent cycle is actually this beautiful thing here. By the way, negative tau is also fine. You know, classically this wouldn't, you know, say make sense. This cycle is the whole thing. And for instanton anti instanton, steepest descent cycle is that. This makes sense because J, K pairs, one of them is steepest descent, the other is steepest ascent. They swap between these two stories because in the exponent, one of them is plus, the other is minus, and the rest is essentially same, okay? But here comes very interesting thing. These configurations are actually non-critical Gaussian, uh, and, uh, it, 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 these configurations are non-Gaussian critical points. So if you look, to the contribution of the critical point itself. If you evaluate this thing exactly at the critical point, you can prove that it is zero, okay? So unlike all the critical points that you learned in my, uh, you know, in our earlier discussion in exponential integrals, which were Gaussian critical points, th there is something genuinely different here. Here, the critical point itself does not contribute. The neighborhood of the critical point does not contribute. While when you had a Gaussian critical point, the neighborhood contributed dominantly. This is the reason that in the textbooks we do an expansion and uh, a Gaussian integral around that expansion and we are happy with it. But the point is, this tells you that you have to do an integral over whole cycle and where the full contribution comes from this whole cycle is very interesting. For instanton, anti -inst for instanton, instanton, you can calculate the full amplitude. And you can actually show that on this cycle, the dominant contribution, if you draw the exponent, is coming from this scale, log A over G, which I called correlated event size, okay? It comes mainly from that. Now, Go to instanton, anti-instanton. Now tau is complex. Tau is, is in R plus i pi, plus minus i pi. 
And the main contribution comes from the vicinity of these points, okay? So this is the notion of critical point at infinity. It is non-Gaussian. The point itself does not contribute, but its symbol gives a very important and profound contribution. And this is very important. Now, here is the very strange thing, okay? I told you there is a configuration in the symbol, but I also told you that the potential was one half W prime square. And if you include quantum correction to it, it is plus or minus T zeta W double prime. Assume you took this as your potential, classical plus quantum. This system, I should tell you one more thing. When you start talking about semi-classics, the first thing you should do is to holomorphize your paths. You no longer talk about real paths, it is gone. The moment you say semi-classics, the notion of real path is gone from the mathematical discussion, okay? So you holomorphize it. You no longer find the critical points or the configurations that contribute to the path integral by solving Newton's equations in the inverted potential. It is not this anymore. This is also a standard part in the textbook, but you shouldn't take it as it is. The real thing you have to solve is a holomorphic version of the Newton's equation. So you have to holomorphize classical mechanics. Then there is a real part of this, an imaginary part of this, and here I use Cauchy-Riemann equation. But the weird thing is, in the real part, there is plus del V over del X. In the imaginary part, there is minus del V over del X. It is not a standard potential problem. And the intuition that you may have from standard looking potential will all break down. And this is something that people found very difficult to accept, the conclusions of which people found very difficult to accept. And now, if you solve with these potential, with this quantum modified potential, actually you discover that there, there is an exact solution. And I will show you what those exact solutions look like. Those exact solutions are complex and those exact solutions will have a characteristic size log A over G. And I should tell you that when, you know, beta goes to infinity, you can plot the interaction between instanton and instanton. There is a repulsive part and this is Fermi zero mode. And this part is almost flat, it's almost a plateau, but it goes, this is the reason that this point is not a Gaussian point and this is really coming from a quantum action, okay? Now, this is for I, I bar. This is the classical picture that people may have drawn in the past, something, I'm sorry, this picture. And they would say, tell you that, oh, instant on anti-instant on annihilates, but it is nonsense, as I said, because when you go to this uh, steepest descent path, there is, this thing does not contribute, okay? And on the steepest descent path, the effective interaction looks like this. There is a minimum, okay? Now, okay, I told you that there is this notion of critical point at infinity. These are very interesting systems. The critical point does not contribute, its symbol contributes. But now let us come back to resurgence. And I will do something uh, quite amazing, actually. I was very much fascinated myself, okay? Study perturbation theory is a function of level number G and zeta, deformation parameter. And zeta equals zero is bosonic case. And zeta equal one is SUSY. And zeta equal two is QS and so on and so forth. And you can derive this expression perturbation theory, okay? And you can show that the large order growth of the perturbation theory is governed by this formula, very similar to our bosonic system. But there are now, these coefficients are non-trivial polynomials of zeta. They are really non-trivial polynomials. I listed some of them here. And Actually, what we did in our papers, uh, in one of our papers in the past, this one, we actually obtained them by matching these polynomials, okay? But we had another way to calculating them, but by matching, honestly. So there were numerical errors, but we were able to find uh, 
these polynomials by looking to large order asymptotics. And you can go ahead and calculate non-perturbative contribution. There is a something called real bion contribution and complex bion contribution and complex bion is twofold ambiguous. And real bion is associated with this picture and complex bion is associated with this picture, okay? And you obtain that the fluctuations around them are given like this. And the magic is these polynomials, not pure numbers, the polynomials are identical. So these imaginary parts, imaginary ambiguous part cancels to all orders, okay? And this is the traditional form of resurgence. Now, actually there is a part of the story that I am not telling you, but I should just at least mention it in the passing. Normally, it is extremely hard to do perturbation theory around the instanton, let alone these complex configurations. But these things, for example, this complex pion is something that, that can talk with perturbation theory. It has topological quantum number zero, if you wish. If you consider it as particle on a circle and put a theta angle, it doesn't have theta angle determinants. But actually, if you write this P fluctuation around instanton, around these bions or instantons as such, there is a formula for these complex configurations as well as instantons that Gerald Dunn and I obtained, which is a, I, I, we call it constructive version of resurgence. The main claim is following. If you know low orders of perturbation theory, say at 10 orders, for these systems I described throughout this talk, you can derive perturbation theory around instanton at nine orders. Okay, if you know n order, you can calculate perturbation theory around instanton n minus one order. So this is a new version of resurgence, but my time does not permit because I want to go to quantum field theory and I will not discuss this. And because of that, we were able to calculate these things very easily. But in reality, even calculating this, for example, is uh, you know, at least six months work in reality. Here it took us, you know, maybe six minutes, okay? Now I want to tell you some profound consequences, physical consequences of these configurations, okay? So go back supersymmetric quantum mechanics, okay? So if you take W prime W to be X cubed divided by three minus X, this is the case very early on discussed by Witten. This is an example in which supersymmetry is dynamically broken. So Witten index is zero and uh, there is no zero energy ground state. There, there is a state which is whose energy delta E is exponential minus two S instant one if you wish. Okay. So ground state energy is zero to all orders in perturbation theory. In fact, if you plug in in this formula, n equals zero, zeta equal one, you will obtain zero here. n equal one, uh, zeta equal zero, you will obtain zero, 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 zero. The ground state energy is zero to all orders in perturbation theory, but it is known to be lifted non-perturbatively. And here, you may think that there is no configuration which will go from here to there, but there is a complex turning point here, however, okay? Now, if you solve equation of motion in this quantum modified system, there is a complex solution which goes there and comes from this complex turning point. And remember, this solution does not exist. If you were to treat semi-classics by using X of tau being real, you have to really promote to Z of tau which is X of tau plus I pi of tau, okay? There is a real part and this red one is imaginary part, okay? There are these solutions. These solutions have the form 2S instanton. And if you have a real saddle, its contribution to the energy is always negative, okay? Universally, as long as you do not, in, you do not have theta angle or berry phase, the contribution of a real saddle to path integral is always negative. But something like this would be disaster because supersymmetry algebra tells you that 
energy must be positive definite. Hamiltonian spectrum of Hamiltonian must be positive definite. And in fact, because this is complex, it has a phase i pi, and it makes it positive definite. Okay, this configuration, weird configuration, smooth but complex configuration, is the thing that supersymmetry is consistent, compatible with uh, semi-classics. A more dramatic example. I will wrap up in two minutes. Is that okay, Eddie? Yeah. Okay. Here's Periodic potential, okay? Um, actually, in this system, Witten index is also accidentally zero, but supersymmetry is not broken. It is zero for a non-trivial reason. There is one bosonic and uh, there is one bosonic and one fermionic state. Okay? So there are zero energy state in the spectrum, zero, uh, some gap here, uh, you know, one so on and so forth while in the other case here uh, you know there is zero and this thing paired up states were lifted up down perturbatively here you see that there is an obvious real solution going from there to there this is this real bion which is an exact solution to these quantum modified equations of motions but there is also this solution which goes there and bounces back from this turning point in the complex domain. And here is the strangest thing. This solution is actually singular. It is really this. This is the real part. Imaginary part is also singular, exactly on the Stokes line. But it is finite action, because in the action, you have z dot square, whose, which comes as x dot square minus y dot square. All of the traditional intuition you know, ruling out non-smooth configurations, so and so, goes to somewhere that you don't want to know, okay? It is a new set of rules for semi-classics now. This configuration, which is the weirdest thing possible, it is singular, it is multi-valued, contributes to the path integral. More than contribute, it rescues the fact there is an exact cancellation between this and that, and let me go to the next page. If you calculate ground state energy, this real bion contributes negatively. And the reason we do not end up in disaster with supersymmetry algebra is because the other saddle in the problem contributes positively, okay? There is this phase attached to it, which we call it hidden topological angle. This is a phase associated with certain timbles and which comes along with this, uh, uh, non-perturbative configurations, okay? Um, so I stop here. Um, okay, you have thanks for that again. Uh, questions? So Mifet, can I ask you, so what is the criteria for allowing, I mean, if this configuration is singular, what is the physical criteria for selecting which configurations are allowed in a semi-classical evaluation of particles? Okay, honestly, the, you, you know, the very honest answer is that um, I think we do not know general set of rules, okay? So example by example, in this case, uh, okay, in this case, we do, because there was a critical point at infinity and we can look to steepest SN cycle, whether it has an appropriate intersection number with the original cycle. But in general, it is a complicated thing. Um, the reason I say so is uh, because there are some examples which yield up, okay. In this example, this complex point, complex bion, is a is actually, despite being complex, okay, is really associated with a with a this is complex Borel plane with a with a <coughs> in, the, in the Borel plane. But to my surprise, there is an old work Balian, uh, Balian, Parisi, and and uh, maybe Voros. And there are cases, and this is revived by Marinho and his friends, 
there are cases in which you have some complex saddles, uh, complex, uh, complex, uh, you know, saddles as well as, uh, you know, some um, singularities in the Borel plane of the real axis. And you would naively think that they wouldn't contribute, but they do. So in some sense, even the notion of Borel summability seems to be, uh, you know, Marino crystallized this quite a bit. Does not seem to be a sufficiency criteria for, is not, does not seem to be sufficient to say that it is the final answer. There is more to the story. And uh, it is necessary, but not sufficient. So I, I do not think that we know the general, general story well, but at least in the case of crit these critical points at infinity and their symbols, because we can simplify story a little bit by just looking to this quasi zero mode integration, which is an ordinary integral. We can answer these questions as we answered ordinary exponential integrals. But the more general story, I think it is an open issue. And it honestly confuses the best of us. You know, uh, the, you probably know there is a nice paper by uh, uh, Dan Harlow, Edwards, uh, which discusses the critical points in the in some two-dimensional QFT, and they are actually at the end of the day, even in the paper, they seem to admit that they are very confused about some singular configurations, whether they should be involved or not, and they say that to get, for example, BTZ formula right, uh, they should be involved, but there is no good set of rules yet. We do not know. But his finiteness of action seems to be one. Finiteness of the action and positivity of the action are good things. Actually, in this- but not uh, sufficient. Balian uh, parisi uh, Voros, actually this thing has, uh, of course, if it was infinite action, it probably wouldn't care. But these things have both real and imaginary part of the action, but the real part of the action is positive. Okay. So if it were to go this direction, in my previous lecture, there was a case of, for example, if you consider a potential like ST squared, doubly periodic potential, okay? You have these potential like that, but there is also a sort of a purely imaginary instanton. There is an instanton like this and purely imaginary instanton like this. One of them causes a singularity in the positive real axis, the other one here. The contribution of this is minus one over G squared and this one is plus one over G squared. Of course, if you included this, it would be a disaster for, you know, for the expansion of the partition function. Uh, this thing should not contribute here. But I suspect that there may be other circumstances, depending on your definition of integration cycle, where exponential plus one over G squared may contribute. Okay. okay. So I think we can close here. Thanks. And um, thanks. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And reconvene in the usual time for the lecture by Clay Cordova. Yep. OK. Thanks. I wanted to send this message to clear course. Oh boy, Let's share.
Hi, Clay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hello. How's it going? Fine. You all set, more or less? Uh, yeah, let me just uh, turn on this. You see the, uh, the board? Yeah. Yes. Very good. Yeah, I thought it worked very well yesterday. It was nice. Yeah, I'm still uh, mastering this. Uh, uh, it was good that you invited me to, you guys invited me to do this because I'm, uh, it's forcing me to learn the sort of best tech for real uh, classroom teaching online. Mm. So hopefully teaching, I'll get better as, you, uh, hopefully I'll get better as time goes on. Yeah, are you teaching in Chicago soon? Um, I'm not teaching this quarter, but I mean, I have every reason to expect that we'll still be online in the winter also, so. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So we'll just wait a couple more minutes. Very good. Okay, maybe we should start. So um, welcome back everyone. Um, Clay's gonna continue with his lecture series and this is uh, lecture number two. All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, so the title of this lecture is uh, Symmetry and its Generalizations. As I've uh, written here, our broad goal today will be to uh, search for and find new concepts of symmetry and anomalies. And we, we saw last time that if we, uh, that symmetry and anomalies are our basic examples of a normalization group invariance. So we'd like to build up those concepts to be as broad and as general as possible. So we'll start uh, with topological operators.
So this is going to be a point on symmetry uh, that does not require currents. Okay, so what will be our initial definitions of symmetry? So usually when you first encounter a, a symmetry, you have a charge Q. And how do you write this charge Q? Well, it's the integral over space of uh, J zero, where uh, this is the current the time component of the current. Okay, so that's the initial definition. And if J is conserved, then Q dot is zero. Very good. Now we're going to start with this uh, general definition. We'll slowly abstract away its essential uh, uh, properties and then get to a place where we don't actually invoke the currents. So the first thing that um, we'd like to generalize our uh, allowed space here. So um, more generally, let's imagine we have a D-dimensional Euclidean quantum field theory. And we'll define a charge uh, as follows. Q, which will now take as input a D minus one manifold. And it will be the integral over that D minus one manifold of star J. And uh, let me, now I'm using a different uh, notation. So let me remind you that if, if you have a current J mu, we can think of this, uh, which is conserved. Then this is the same as saying that star J, the Hodge star of J, this will be a D minus one form with D of star J equals zero. So star J will be closed. And now, so, so, so far, all I've really done is I've allowed you to produce any manifold here. And if we're working in a Euclidean quantum field theory, that's, an, that's a useful generalization because we don't really have a preferred spatial slice. So, okay, those are the charges. What about the group element, the symmetry group? So we can also exponentiate. So then we'll define u alpha. Again, it will take as input some d minus one manifold. And we just exponentiate the charge. And you could think of this number alpha that has appeared here as a group label, group element label. Okay, so if we have currents, then we have conserved charges. And if we have conserved charges, we can exponentiate them to make these uh, uh, U alpha operators, which you can think of as doing finite symmetry transformations. And we'll, we'll explain how that works uh, momentarily. Now, uh, thinking ahead, for continuous symmetries, all of these things seem equivalent, but thinking ahead, the U alphas will be preferred. So it will be important for us to get away from the charges and start focusing on elements. And the reason is that a discrete symmetry has no analog of charges. Well, 
but it does have the finite group element transformations. Okay, so these are just some definitions, but what are the properties of these basic definitions? Okay, so let's go over the key properties. Okay, so I advertise these as topological operators. Let's now unpack that. So the claim is that U alpha, which takes as input an a D minus manifold, some quantum operator that uh, we could think of as the finite transformation of this symmetry on uh, a spatial slice that's this M D minus one manifold. This depends topologically on this manifold M D minus one. What does that mean? Let's look at it uh, at the level of the charges for a minute. So here we take star J and we integrate it over M D minus one. So this is Q on M D minus one. And now let's sub from it a similar quantity, but where I've done a small perturbation of this manifold M D minus one. So I take star J but I integrate it on a different spatial uh, on a slightly perturbed manifold. Okay, now we use theorem. So this is equal to the integral of D of star J on some D manifold XD, where this is interpolating between M D minus one and tilde d minus one. So I've done a small perturbation of the manifold. And so I can always find some xd that interpolates between m d minus one and m tilde d minus one. And since j was conserved, d star j was zero. So this is just zero. OK, so this uh, we, we see that the charges, uh, as defined above, depend only topologically on the input manifold m d minus one. The same is then true uh, for for the uh, group operators u alpha. And you see that this uh, topological dependence of these operators on this manifold m d minus one is actually the same really encoding current conservation. And so more generally, when we think about uh, forgetting about currents, and just defining things in terms of the existence of the U alpha, we'll just uh, we'll say that they are defined to have this property that they are topological. Okay. So the next key property is that U alpha of M D one implements symmetry transformations. on operators. OK, so uh, what is the picture of that? So let's imagine that we have here a sphere, a d minus 1 sphere. So this is some s d minus 1. And on it, I put u alpha s d minus one. So there's a small sphere inside uh, my space time, my Euclidean space time. And at the center of the sphere, I put a local operator. So this is some local operator. And let's imagine the charge of that operator is Q. 
Now I claim that this is equal to removing the U alpha operator and having instead phase e to the i alpha q and then the same local operator sitting at the origin. So why is Hello. this true? I have a question here. Do you yeah. mean you're putting the, I mean, the operator is surrounded by the sphere. So in other words, you're putting in the center of the ball. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. Okay. Yeah, so I, I imagine that we're in uh, Euclidean space-time. There's a local operator uh, sitting at the origin and there's a small sphere uh, on which U alpha sits and that sphere surrounds the operator. And okay. the statement of this picture is that you can, um, you can shrink the sphere, shrink the U alpha and remove it at the cost of introducing E to the I alpha Q where Q is the charge of O. Why is this true? This is just a rewriting in fact of the ward entity. So this is a rewriting of the fact that D of star J um, I said above it is zero. That, that's wrong when you have a charged operator. So it should be Q times delta D of zero, which is where the operator sits. So if you think about um, trying to pull the sphere through the operator, right? We, we're trying to use this, uh, this topological property. So you know the fact that it's a round sphere doesn't matter. I can perturb the sphere a little bit. And so I'd like to uh, shrink the sphere to nothing. So as I shrink, I shrink, I shrink, I, uh, I uh, can use the first property and nothing is happening. But then at some key moment, the sphere has to cross the operator in order to shrink all the way to zero. And at that moment, I'll encounter this correction. D star J is Q delta D of zero. And that gives me this phase. And once, once the sphere and the operator are unlinked, then there's no obstruction to using the first property and shrinking the uh, all the way to zero. Okay, so in general, in quantum field theory, we will define global symmetry So let me underline the word define here by the existence of such operators U. And where There's is the group law? question in the chat, Clay, sorry, yeah. um, which is, read it. Um, is M D minus one um, a compact manifold um, or can it also, oh, I think it may be, what was meant was closed manifold, or or can it have a boundary? Um, I, I think you should. Uh, so in the in the more advanced uh, course, which will not be given here, um, one has to think about uh, all sorts of fancy issues like that. But I think right now you should just think that M D minus one is a manifold without boundary. So for simplicity, you could imagine that uh, space time is uh, compact Euclidean manifold and M D minus one inside it is some D minus one dimensional closed compact submanifold. Um, there are generalizations uh, when you allow space to be non-compact or space time to be non-compact. In fact, we will discuss one of those uh, uh, momentarily, but the basic case is, um, is when M is compact and closed. Okay, so in general, in, in quantum field theory, we like to get away from using the currents because if we if we uh, focused on currents, we won't be able to really take advantage of discrete symmetries, which don't have currents. So instead, we'll just focus on these U's, and we'll take the topological property to uh, replace current conservation, and we'll take this um, this kind of pictor uh, pictorial uh, uh, indication of what happens when an operator uh, crosses a U to replace the ward identity. And so um, you could ask, where is the group law? How do I know what group the symmetry is? And then the following composition, so we'll have 
UG1 of MD minus one times UG2 of MD minus one is equal to UG1 G2 of MD minus one. So if you fuse these operators uh, with different labels, you get the composition in the group. Okay, let me sketch an example. What's everyone's favorite example of a discrete symmetry? So we could look in the Ising model, which has a Z2 symmetry. How will we think about it pictorially? So imagine on one side, so let's think of the Ising model as some interacting spin. So over here, we've got spins, they're all up. And then um, we cut space time in two with a plane. And on the other side, we flip the spins. So the Z2 is a symmetry. That, that means that if I globally, everywhere in all of space-time, flip the spins, nothing happens. So this spin flip is detected uh, only on this defect. So this is the defect. And this defect is the, uh, the topological operator implementing the symmetry transfer. Uh, you, can, you can see that, for instance, um, if you try to pull us by my basic definition, if I try and pull a local excitation that is a spin through the plane, it flips the, it flips the direction of the spin. So it's implementing the Z2 transformation. So this defect is the Z2 operator. It's what I called U above. Now, uh, interestingly, um, in general, U is not the integral of anything local. So this is a good example to keep in mind. We have a Z2 global symmetry. There is some, uh, some operator uh, which lives in one lower dimension. So if, we, if we're doing the Ising model, say, in three dimensions, there is a two-dimensional defect operator, U, implementing this Z2 symmetry. But it's not related to any current in the theory. So if we want to understand uh, how this symmetry works, we need to uh, just grow up and deal directly with this U. OK. <clears throat> so that was our first, uh, our first generalization of the concept of symmetry. We learned uh, about the U's in order to deal basically with discrete symmetries. And now I'm going to introduce the second generalization. So I'm going to introduce a higher form global symmetry. OK, so let's just come out and, and define it straight away. So we'll, um, so what's the definition? A Q form global symmetry is defined, well, let's say characterized by topological operators.
of co-dimension q plus one. So we will call them uh, u sub g. And now as input, they take m d minus q minus one manifolds. So um, the case q equals zero, this is ordinary global symmetry. that we talked about above. And now we're going to talk about these Q form global symmetries for more general Q, Q larger than zero. And they're characterized by these topological operators that reside on lower dimensional manifolds. Okay, what does the, uh, all, all this uh, plus and minus one might, uh, might look a bit silly. Why did I define it this way? The reason is that the charged operators have dimension Q. So what's the picture? So what's, in other words, I'm, what's the picture analogous to the ward identity? So it's like this. Um, there's a question. Uh, Clay, yes. if you don't mind. Um, in the group law for the topological operators, you know, when you're taking the products of the U's, yeah. um, the person is asking, the, the, do the two manifolds have to be the same or can there be um, intersections between the two? So two, in that group law, the two manifolds are the same. Um, so more generally, if I say intersect, the, the use with different group elements, something interesting will happen. At the intersection, it'll be something, um, something like G1, G2 is living at that, um, at that smaller locus, but it's a more complicated configuration. The simple multiplication group law, a kind of uh, operator product, if you like, of these U's occurs when they're on the exact same manifold. Okay. Um, now, uh, okay, so, so here we were discussing the charged operators having uh, dimension Q. So let's imagine that this uh, vertical thing is, a line, is some kind of extended operator L. Extended um, and dimension Q. And here, this will be U uh, alpha on m d minus one minus q. We could think of it as a sphere for the purposes of this uh, discussion. And just like before, we'd like to remove, we'd like to shrink this uh, m d minus one minus q, this, uh, this small link around L. And we can do that at the expense of a charge, e to the i alpha q uh, L, and then we still have L. So this is, uh, this is, if you like, uh, what's replacing the ward identity in the case of general Q-form global symmetry. And I know that uh, if this is the first time you're seeing this, it all seems very uh, highfalutin. Soon we will discuss some concrete examples. Um, but I just want to get the basic um, abstract structure out in front of your eyes. OK. So. You might also be curious, what does a Q-form symmetry mean if you have a Hilbert space, right? Here I'm thinking in a very Euclidean way, but what about in the Hilbert space? So um, in the Hilbert space picture, so let's imagine uh, we're talking about the Hilbert space associated to space, to a spatial slice y d minus one. So then uh, a Q form gives one charge for each non-trivial 
d minus uh, one minus q cycle in y d minus one. So uh, it's a natural question to think of, suppose I'm doing ordinary quantization. I have space, I have some Hilbert space. Uh, is that Hilbert space in a representation of this Q form symmetry? And the answer is yes, but the structure is a little more intricate than usual. Instead of just saying that the Hilbert space is in a representation full stop, you get several different charges depending on the topology of the spatial slice. And the number of, of, of charges is determined by the number of uh, non-trivial cycles of the appropriate dimension. OK. So it has to be, the cycles have to be homologically non-trivial then? To yes, get a non cycles have to be homologically non-trivial. Um, now, uh, it is tempting to think that that means that, for instance, in R uh, d minus one, you would not get anything, but that's not really correct because because of the because R d minus one is uh, non-compact. You have to be uh, care about what's going on at infinity. So for these purposes, um, non-compact planes inside which are subsets of R d minus one would count as non-trivial cycles. So uh, in fact, we will discuss that at the end of this uh, at, at the end of this lecture. Okay, so um, that's that's all the abstract stuff, and now we'll do some examples. So, uh, one form symmetry in gauge theory. Okay, so let's start easy. Let's start with continuous one form symmetry. Continuous one form symmetry is related to conserved currents now with two indices. So an ordinary or zero form global symmetry is related to a uh, continuous symmetry is related to a conserved current with one index. And a one-form symmetry is correspondingly related to a current with two indices. So uh, just again, as a reminder, if we have d mu of j mu nu equals 0, then this is the same as saying that d star j, star j will now be a d minus 2 form. And this will be 0, at least away from charged stuff. OK, so uh, what's, what's supposed to be your go-to example of a theory that has continuous one-form symmetry? So 4D Maxwell is a great example. By this, I mean literally free U1 gauge theory. So let's start with no matter. It has two one-form symmetry. So what are they? Let's call one of them U1 uh, electric. And here the uh, superscript one is supposed to us that it's a one form symmetry. The group is U1 for the symmetry, but I'm just trying to remind us that we're talking about a one form symmetry. So what's the current? Well, as I'm sure everybody knows, d mu of f mu nu is zero equations of motion. So this f is a j. It's a current with two indices that's conserved. There's another u1 one form symmetry, which is often called the magnetic one form symmetry. And that's because uh, d mu star f mu nu equals zero. And this is due to the Bianchi identity. So 
So we have two one form symmetries in free Maxwell theory. What are the charged objects? So charged objects under one form symmetries are lines. So let's call line operator L and let's for simplicity say that L is uh, extended a long time and at origin in space. <clears throat> so uh, how do we see that the charge uh, is measured correctly uh, by these currents? Well, these are really just uh, essentially Gauss's laws. So we have one over two pi integral or S2 of star F. And this is the electric charge of L. So here I'm imagining uh, uh, the S2 sphere surrounding the origin. If I look at just a spatial slice, then L looks like a point because it's at the origin in space. And we have a sphere S2 surrounding it. So this is L and this is a spatial slice here. Okay, so, um, so, for, the, so for the electric uh, one form symmetry, we learn that the that the electric one form measures the electric charge of the line L, and so the charged objects are Wilson lines, or more generally, dions carrying electric charge. We can do it for the magnetic uh, one form symmetry, and then this is just the magnetic charge. So for instance, Tuft lines are charged. So uh, this one was for U1, one electric. And this one was for U1, one magnetic. <clears throat> Any questions about this? There is a question in the chat, Clay. Yeah. Um, but it's more sort of related to the comment I had, or the question I had about homological non-triviality. That's um, fine, yeah. I think they were asking, could you explain how that works in this particular case for Maxwell theory? Um, say, I presume they mean on R4. Uh, right, so, um, so the, uh, you mean, in what sense is it true that, uh, uh, sorry, which, uh, you mean this Hilbert space point? Um, about, yeah, the, exactly the Hilbert space point, yeah. Um, well, I think, so I am actually going to explain uh, something very close to that in detail at the end of the lecture. So maybe uh, okay, that's when fine. we come to the relation to confinement. So let's put that off for a little bit. Okay. Um, any other questions right now? I have a quick question about uh, yeah. this. Uh, so in, when you add fermionic matter, this first electric one form symmetry will be will be broken because you will have the current on the right hand side. That's but, correct. We're going to discuss that momentarily as well. But the electric charge is still conserved, like even when you add fermions, even when you add like matter. We, so, we'll discuss exactly what's conserved and what's not in just a few minutes, I promise. Okay, in, thanks. In, in exactly that situation. But mm -hmm. le let me come to that. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I'd like to uh, I, I'd like to keep going and un unpack this example and give you e ever more definitions of these uh, charged uh, or more uh, explicit formulas for these charged operators and how to think about them. You know, usually when you talk about a symmetry in a simple quantum field theory, 
you define it first by saying that there's a transformation on the fields. So, you know, usually you say, well, if I have a U1 symmetry, maybe I have a complex scalar and the phase rotates and that's the transformation on this field. And from there you get all the properties. Uh, you could ask if there's an analogous thing here um, and there is. So I like to tell you how to think about that in this simple case, because it's very concrete. So uh, we'll look at alpha for the electric one, which is the integral, well, sorry, there's an exponential I forget this. Integral uh, star f. And let's say it's on a surface sigma. And uh, we'll work locally. So I'll take sigma to be, say, uh, the xy plane at t equals z equals zero. So more generally, sigma could have some interesting topology, but uh, I'm just going to look at a little patch uh, where this is locally correct. And we're, we'd like to see how does this u act on the fields. So that's uh, what we're trying to figure out. So let's set temporal gauge. So in temperature, AT is equal to zero. And that implies that star F sub XY, that's the thing that appears in this integral. Sigma is the XY plane and star F, um, therefore we only care about the XY components. So this is up to some numbers that won't be relevant here. This is like DT of A, z. Now, we should remember that dt az is canonically conjugate to z. So this enables us to figure out what is the transformation on the fields. So we can put u alpha a i uh, alpha inverse. And we can ask, what does this do? So uh, clearly, if i is not z, happens. But if i equals z, then we're exponentiating the, the conjugate momentum. So we get a shift. And we get a shift exactly where we do the integral. So a z picked up alpha times delta of z times delta of t. So what has happened? What happened is that a was shifted by a flat connection. That's what happened. So uh, an alternative point of view on these symmetries uh, could be to say, well, I have a Lagrangian. I look at the shifts of the variables. Um, and we have to be a bit careful because it's a gauge theory. So we have to understand which shifts can or cannot be removed by gauge transformations. This one cannot be. Uh, and then we could define symmetries from there. Uh, here, I've done it in a different order uh, because I care about you know, doing things in the most uh, sort of invariant way in quantum field theory, but this is also a useful perspective for explicit calculations. Can I ask a question? Yes. Maybe yes. it's silly, but um, so this operator that you have just defined, this u of alpha, which is the exponent uh, exponentiation of the of the flux of the integral of the of the electric flux, for example. Yeah. Uh, if, if there are no charges, if you are in, in Maxwell field, it is it is zero. So so this operator is very uh, trivial. It, it, it is not it, it is not zero. Why is it zero? F is a quantum operator. It's not zero. It has non-trivial correlation functions. 
Ah, okay, okay. So it's going to have uh, fluctuations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're not, we're not just working on shell. I mean, in the in, F is a quantum operator. Thank you. Okay. Um, I should say that uh, another maybe drawback of this point of view, and um, while this looks so clean and nice for the electric one, for the uh, magnetic definition is not so so easy. Magnetic uh, is not easy to define this way. Of course, you could use electromagnetic duality and say, well, in some variables, it looks simple. But the point is that the electric and magnetic ones cannot be made simultaneously simple in terms of their actions on the fields. So that, that's, that's another, that, that was one definition, the, the transformation on the fields. There's another third definition, which is a disorder definition. Actually, Clay, could I ask a question here as well? Yeah. Um, about the black connection. So should I, some in terms of topology, should I be thinking then that we uh, are actually, in terms of homology, thinking about taking, removing that, that R2, that sits at yeah, Z equals yeah, two yeah, and yeah, zero, yeah, yeah, and then yeah, you're, yeah. you're going around it. Yeah, we're we're always talking sort of away from insertions when we're talking about homology, which is, okay. uh, for instance, when we, I mean, that enters here when we talk about um, these ward identities. For instance, where was this picture? E even here at the um, uh, here when we were talking initially about the U alpha surrounding a local operator. The reason that U alpha is allowed to be non-trivial and give you this phase is precisely because we think of the local operator as kind of puncturing space-time. And then there is a non-trivial homological sphere that surrounds that local operator. Yeah. And so it, th that's generally the, the philosophy when thinking about uh, homology cycles throughout. Okay. So one, one more definition, a, a disorder definition. Um, let's, uh, let's imagine, so U alpha again is co-dimension two because we're talking about a one form symmetry in, in uh, Maxwell theory. So if we look in a plane, in the orthogonal plane, it will look like a point in a plane. So let's draw such a plane. So this is the orthogonal plane. To U alpha, here is U alpha. And there's a nice little cycle here that we can draw the ground it. And so we could define the insertion of U alpha uh, by requiring that A has holonomy around this little cycle. So this is a disorder order definition, meaning that we only integrate over A's satisfying this in the path integral. And we consider that to be the insertion of U. And that's very analogous to Tuft's definition of a Tuft line. OK, so those are, uh, th those are various different definitions of the one form symmetry in free Maxwell theory. We've got it from the currents. We've got it from an action on the fields. And now we've also got it from a disorder definition. And they're all equivalent. Uh, whichever point of view you use, um, it's, uh, it's up to you which is the most convenient for your calculation. Now, there were some questions about char charged matter. So let's talk a little bit about charged matter. Maybe before you do that, there's another question. Yeah. I'll just read it. It's quite long. Uh, is it not the integral of the flux equal to 0 as an operator equation in the physical gauge invariant Hilbert space? 
I understand the electromagnetic field has fluctuations, but the gauge constraint is exact. It has no fluctuations. Am I missing something? Um, well, if you look at correlation functions of the operator F in Yang Mills theory, they're not in Maxwell theory, they are not zero. So yes, I think, uh, I think you are missing something. No, but, but uh, just, just one question. Yeah, the correlation function of the, of the electrom of the F mu nu are not zero. But if yep. you integrate yep. over a closed surface, which is a, a closed manifold and, and a sphere, I, I claim, I think that the correlation functions of that are, are trivial in the gauge invariant field of space. Uh, not if you have Wilson lines inserted. So in fact, this whole, this, uh, right, this discussion here, where was it? Uh, here is exactly telling you when you can get um, something non-zero. So, you know, if the if the sphere is empty, then you get zero. That's another uh, consequence of these formulas. If the sphere is not empty, that is, if there is a line defect with some charge going through it, then you get something non-zero. Okay. I mean, the, think you can think through it in the way of the in the action variables, the um, or, or in the formulation with the action. When you have a line, say a Wilson line, you have a, a new term in the action, which is the integral of A along that line. So the equations of motion are different. They have a delta function contribution there. And that's what's giving you this, this new, uh, this non-zero answer. Okay, thanks. No problem. Good question. Okay, so uh, charge matter. So that was all in free Maxwell theory. Uh, very good, there are a million definitions there, but it seems a bit boring and limited. So what if we include charge matter? So now it's in an interacting theory. So let's imagine here is a Wilson line. With some positive charge. Well, what will happen? We have charge matter and we all, uh, we all know that the charge matter will try to screen this. So the, the vacuum will put little pairs and the pairs will arrange themselves to try and screen off this long range charge, etc. So these are pairs uh, created to screen Screen the line. What does that mean? That means that the effective charge let's call the Wilson line L of L, the effective charge of L is position dependent. So if you try, uh, if you try to uh, measure the charge very, very close to the line, you'll see the full charge Q of the line. But as you uh, as you take um, your sphere larger and larger, uh, you'll see th this screening effect will take over, and you'll see less and less effective charge. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means symmetry is broken. Why? What was the axiom that was broken? Remember I said that the one form symmetry generators should be topological. That means that if I go back up here, if I look here at this formula, say I give this a radius r, this should be r independent. But down here, we're exactly uh, learning that the radius would matter. So that means the one form symmetry has been broken, this electric one form symmetry. Now, uh, more generally, it's kind of interesting. 
let's consider um, the special case where the particles have charge Q, which is greater than one. So then uh, something interesting will happen. <clears throat> then we'll have the U1, one form symmetry, the electric one form symmetry. It will still be broken, but not all the way. It will be broken to a discrete ZQ one form symmetry. What is this physically saying? We can only screen multiples of Q. Let's see this a little more concretely in equations. It sounds too abstract. So let's test. Let's test if the charges, if the U's are topological. How would we do it? Okay, so we're supposed to take exp i alpha integral over some surface sigma two of star f. That was what we're trying to test if it's topological. Let's put here the same thing. But now I wiggle sigma two a little bit. Okay, so what we were supposed to do is um, we were supposed to, when we had it was conserved, we integrated this over some three manifold X3. Sorry, we had, uh, forgot the exponential, I alpha integral over some three manifold x3, which interpolates between these two surfaces, sigma two. And we had d star j, sorry, d star uh, uh, f. But d star f, according to the Maxwell uh, equation, is in fact j electric. So that's the current. So here I'm using that D star F is J electric. Okay. So now uh, it looks bad because it looks like this is just some non-trivial operator on the right-hand side. So maybe we lost the topological property, but let's be in the situation I said before. Let's imagine that- uh, Sorry. Uh the star f is star of j, right? Star of j electric, wouldn't it? Um, sorry. Um, yes, I'm probably messing up my, uh, uh, if j electric is a one form. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, then star of j is a three form. Yes, you're correct. So star j electric is a multiple of q. So imagine the charge is Q. Uh, we still have a topological operator. If we restrict alpha to be two pi K over Q. So this is how we check that if the uh, charges are multiple of Q, we will still have a ZQ one form symmetry. That means we can't choose alpha continuously. It will just be, it will just have to uh, take some discrete values. So here, uh, of course, K is going to be an integer. Okay. Okay, last few minutes, uh, we'll go to a uh, 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 new topic. Um, that was all about abelian gauge theory. Let's briefly discuss the technology in non-abelian gauge theory.
So uh, for instance, we could be talking about the subject of the first lecture, S-U-N Yang Mills. And here I'd like to stress that in the following, the global form of the group matters. So for instance, SU2 versus SO3 makes a difference discussion. Okay. So what kind of Wilson lines are there in SUN Yang Mills? The Wilson line operators are in representations of SUN. So we can think of these as all built from the fundamental. Various symmetrization or, uh, or uh, anti-symmetrization procedures. It's often convenient to think of them in terms of tableaus. So for instance, is the fundamental. So box is fundamental. It's, uh, it's n-dimensional because we're talking about SUN. Uh, maybe we could consider a symmetric tensor with two indices. We could consider uh, an tensor with two indices. Another common representation is the adjoint. What does that look like? So it's a big hook. This is the adjoint and so forth. It will be important for us to know that the uh, center of SUN, so I'm gonna take another few minutes just to finish off here, it will not take very long. Center of SUN is uh, the times the N by N identity matrix, uh, where lambda is a phase an n root of unity. Okay. So there's a useful definition, which is the nality of a rep. What is this? This is the charge under the center. of SU, which is equal to the number of boxes in the tableau mod n. So this, this thing is an integer modulo n for SUN. So the nality of the fundamental is 1. The nality of the symmetric or, or anti-symmetric rank 2 tensor is 2 the nality of the adjoint is zero. Okay. So an important comment is that about the physics of screening in SUN is that in pure Yang Mills, the only fields are adjoints. So, you know, SUN gauge Yang Mills theory is an interacting theory with charged matter, but those charge that charged matter is gluon, and those gluons are in the adjoint representation of SUN. So that means that if we think about what can be screened in SUN, we can only screen things that have levels of n boxes. Okay, so to conclude, what we learned from this comments about screening 
we think back to our discussion of uh, U1, we'll conclude that SUN Yang Mills has a ZN1 one form global symmetry. So that's a very nice conclusion. And what's the picture? So uh, of course it looks kind of the same. We have this symmetry oper operator U alpha. This is some S2. And we have a Wilson line coming in here. This is L, which is a Wilson line. And we can write this as the exponential of I alpha nality of L times the line L again, where alpha is restricted to be 2k over n. So uh, as above, we can define this using disorder or shifts by flat connections. And I encourage you to uh, think about that to make sure you've got all the details straight before the next lecture. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks, Clay. Thank you very much. Um, there were a couple more questions. We're not going. We can't. We haven't got that much time because again, there's a right a tutorial coming up. Yeah, and um, the tutorial is coming up. Uh, uh, coming up soon yeah, exactly. for us too. So, um, so <clears throat> feel free to uh, store up all your, uh, collect all your your questions and pepper me and Kentaro during the. Uh, Discussion. I didn't quite get to the the relation to confinement that was supposed to be in the discussion today, but it will be bumped um, to the next time. Great. So yeah, um, I also propose we move the question any questions to the discussion session, which is at nineteen fifteen um, European time. So like in an hour or so. Okay. Thanks, Clay. So um, let's thank uh, Clay again, either virtually or you can clap if you want. I will clap. And the next, yeah, so the, we have the discussion and then there will also be um, uh, the next lecture, same time tomorrow, I believe. <laughs>